on YouTube now. Red All right. Uh, good evening, everyone, and welcome to yet another day of India's largest virtual science festival. India Science Month Online is India's largest online platform for public engagement, which aims at bringing together science and society. We are here to bring to you the voice of science. This is your one stop destination for everything related to science and technology with a uh, a theme of health, robotics, space, SciComm, and general science. We are bringing together researchers, scientists, science communicators, educators, and students from all over the world to come together, collaborate, and make this a big scientific revolution in India. It is with great pleasure that I'm able to tell you that our festival has been doing really great over the past few weeks. And we have had thousands of attendees joining in from all over the world. Uh, our festival is going to go on till the 31st of January. So a last few more days to go. So make sure that you tune into our um, social media channels, go over to our YouTube channels and check out the uh, talks that we've had till date. We have had some really interesting talks, panel discussions, workshops, games, demonstrations, and so on. The best part about this festival is that everything is for free because we truly believe in making science accessible to all. Um, before we start with today's talk, which is going to be really interesting and something a lot of people have been looking forward to, I'm just going to launch a quick poll on your screens in order uh, to understand the demographics of our attendees. We would love to know a little more about the audience members that have joined us today. So um, I'm just going to quickly launch a poll, and I would request you all to give us the answers for the same. Right, so uh, the results for the first poll are out and I'd like to inform all our audience members as well as our speaker that uh, a majority of our attendees are college students and uh, then we have a few school students. We have a few professionals working in uh, technology and a few working in life sciences as well as medicine. Uh, we don't have any attendees from the field of arts or entrepreneurship, but we have um, a few faculty members in our uh, uh, in our attendees too. Um, and uh, now if I could just request you to answer one more poll uh, so that I know a little more about how much you know about the topic at hand. Thank you. 
So uh, the results of the second poll tell us that maximum number of our attendees have read a little about the topic at hand and uh, don't know much about it, but are curious to know more. And a very few percentage of our audience members are working professionals in this field. So it looks like we have a very interesting mix of people uh, in the audience today. And um, I'd just like to tell all our attendees that we have some exciting social media competitions going on. So if you head over to our Twitter channel, you can um, participate in our tweeting competition where you can tell us what is the most exciting part of um, any talk or panel discussion that you have attended. Take a screen grab on your phones or your laptops, put it up on Twitter and tell us what you like the most about the session. The best tweets get exciting prizes. Um, we also have a bunch of games lined up for today as well as the weeks coming ahead. So make sure you go to our website and register for all of those. And with that, um, I won't take more of your time. It is with great pleasure that I get to introduce Professor Peter Cork all the way from Australia. So could I please request you to turn on your video and audio? Thank you so much for joining us. For all our it's attendees, for all our attendees, I'd just like to um, introduce uh, Professor Peter. He is a very, very well-known Australian roboticist and is a distinguished professor of robotic vision at the Queensland University of Technology. He is very, very well known for his work in field robotics and robotic vision and is also actively involved in the education and communication of robotics in Australia. Um, sir, it is such an honor to have you with us here today. And so excited to know what I do if I could just uh, uh, I think we have a poor connection. Uh, it was fine before. Shruti, should I start? I missed the last bit you said. Yeah. Okay. Oh, Let no, just I just said that we're very, very happy to have you here. Please go <laughs> ahead. Yeah. All right. Thank you very much for the opportunity to, to be uh, with you this, this evening. I, I'm a, an engineer by training, uh, fell into robotics almost by accident, and I've spent most of my career trying to equip robots with the ability to see. Uh, and seeing is something that we do effortlessly all of the time. We're very visual creatures. Uh, doing vision for robots is much, much harder. So in this talk, what I want to do is just explain a bit about how vision for humans works, a bit about how vision for robots works, contrast the two of them, uh, and then hopefully we can have some, some good conversations at the end. So that's, that's my objective. So when it comes to robots, I think people have got all sorts of different opinions about robots. People think that robots are perhaps going to be the end of humanity. People imagine wonderful uh, robots that can do amazing good for humanity and for the world. And for other people, a robot might just be a very mundane machine that cleans the floor or builds a car or something like that. A lot of what we know about robots uh, comes from fiction. And so perhaps the most famous fictional robots are these two are uh, from Star Wars movies. They came into our world in 1977. And uh, they're very competent uh, robots uh, in all sorts of ways. They're competent with language. They're competent in breaking into a Death Star and things like that. And we've seen robots in movies that have got empathy and charm. And so robots have all these sorts of characteristics. And back in the day, in the, in the 1950s, there were robot movies. And back in those days, the robots in the movies was a person inside a metal suit, right? And in 1956, you think that's reasonable. The technology was very primitive in 1956. But the sad thing is that a lot of the robots that we know and love from, from the movies also are people in metal suits. So Anthony Daniels is the actor inside C-3PO for very many of the Star Wars movies. Kenny Baker was the uh, actor inside R2-D2. 
Uh, and Rachel Ma was the actor inside the robot in the movie called Robot and Frank. And we've seen over the, over the decades so many different robot movies. Uh, certainly a lot of them came out in, the, in 2015. I think we had two, two, two well-known robot movies came out in that year. And so a lot of what the general population knows or understands about robots comes from these fictional representations of robots. And what we see are robots that are very, very capable. And this fiction is not just movies, it's also books. And Isaac Asimov was a very prolific writer of books about robotics. And he even imagined laws that should govern robots when they're in operation. And in many ways, they're quite sensible laws. But many people think that there are laws of robotics. But no, it's only fiction. Now, the word robot itself was coined in fiction. Uh, it was coined 100 years ago this year in a play by a Czech playwright, uh, Karl Kapek, uh, in a play called Rossum's Universal Robots. And the word robot in the Czech language has got some connotations of slavery or forced labor. Uh, so it has perhaps unpleasant roots. And, and the theme of this, of this play was that human beings were tired of doing manual labor. So they built machines to do the labor for them. And the robots, I guess, understood that they were being exploited and they rose up uh, and they destroyed the humans. And this was a 1921 play. And there are so many movies that have been written on this very theme, but it was first it came in a play 100 years ago. If you think about robots today, they're much more prosaic than the robots that we see in fiction. So on the left, you see robots that are building cars in a Tesla motor car factory in California. And on the right hand side, you see mobile robots in an Amazon fulfillment center. And these robots, the orange robots on the right, move around a warehouse and they pick up shelves full of product and they move it around the warehouse. So it's stacked up in shelves in a warehouse. Robots come in, pick up the shelves and carry them away to people who are going to take products out of those shelves, put them in the box, which gets dispatched to you. So this is the reality of robots today. It's nowhere near as exciting or imaginative as the robots that we see in fiction. And certainly there are some very, very capable robots around now. And many of you might have seen YouTube videos from Boston Dynamics. Some of my favorite ones are here. And up in the top right corner, there are some aerial robots doing juggling uh, at ETH, which is a university in Zurich. Now, all these robots are incredibly capable, but they really, they can't see. Right? Their ability to see their world is very, very limited and they rely on other ways of understanding what's in their world. And so for human beings, vision is perhaps our most powerful sense. And for humans that uh, have lost the sense of sight or never had the sense of sight, it is a very profound disability. And so we need to think that robots really share that disability. Robots are effectively blind. Uh, it makes it very difficult for them to understand what's in the world. And as a researcher, I'm really interested in redressing that problem. How can we equip robots with the ability to see as well as we see, or perhaps even be able to see better than we see? And if you look at the sorts of industries where robots are common, and I showed before in manufacturing and in logistics in warehouses, Robots work well there, but there are so many other industries where people work very effectively in mining, in construction, in agriculture, in healthcare, uh, and much, much small scale manufacturing, but we don't see robots at all. And it's my very strong belief that the reason robots are not in these environments is because they can't see, they don't understand what's around them. And that's something that human workers are doing all the time. They're building a model of what's in the world, looking at other workers, looking at where the material is, planning what to do based on input that comes through their eyes. And robots don't have eyes, they don't have a sense of vision. Therefore, we're not, they're not competent enough to work in these other areas of our economy. And so it's certainly true that computers are very much better than human beings at certain things. So we know human beings are better than, sorry, we know that computers are much better than humans at the game of chess, have been for, uh, more than two decades, and they're better than humans at the game of Go and have been for nearly five years now. But there are other things, surprisingly, that, human, that robots are not very good at. And I would argue that this small child can recognize a chess piece and pick it up quite deftly. 
where a robot for a robot today, that is still a cutting edge research problem. How to recognize the piece and move in and delicately grasp it, lift it off the board without knocking other things over. So it's kind of surprising that there's a thing that a small child can do much, much better than the best computers and best robots on the planet. And one of the characteristics of human vision that amazes me is our ability to generalize. So I could probably, with my students, we could train a robot to recognize these chess pieces. But then you could put another chessboard in front with differently shaped chess pieces or chess pieces that were shiny or chess pieces that were transparent. And the system that we built would fail utterly. So human beings have a wonderful ability to generalize. And the artificially intelligent systems that we build are currently very, very poor at this generalization. They're very, very brittle or fragile. So if we think about the sense of vision in organisms, the sense of vision is widely spread through, through, through animals. Uh, so a very simple creature like a bee has got a brain that weighs just one gram. It's got about a million neurons. Yet a bee can learn the location of a flower from other bees. They do a dance and the bee learns the location of the flower. It will fly a certain distance at a certain angle with respect to the sun, land on the moving flower, gather the nectar and the pollen, and then return to the hive. All of that with a brain that weighs one gram. Now, we've got much bigger brains. Our brain weighs one and a half kilograms. We've got 10 to the 11 neurons, uh, so many orders of magnitude more than the bee has. A third of our brain is dedicated to processing information that comes in through our eyes. So we have a vision engine in our head it weighs 500 grams, one third of our brain dedicated to vision, which says something about how important it is for the survival of, of human beings, that we can afford to devote so much of our body uh, to that uh, one way of sensing the world. So life on planet Earth has been around for about 3 billion years. And for two and a half billion years, life on planet Earth was very boring really single cell organisms moving around, absorbing nutrient uh, from the oceans. And that was it. Uh, they used chemical receptors to uh, understand the gradients of chemicals, chem chemicals and nutrients in the ocean, and they could develop some ability to move up uh, a chemical gradient. 540 million years ago, an amazing thing happened. There was a genetic mutation and this molecule that you see on the right hand side uh, was adapted in a way that changed it from being a chemical sensor to a light sensor. And inside that became wedged uh, this molecule, uh, cisretinol. And the interesting thing about that cisretinol is when a photon hits it, it twists, it changes shape, and you can see the right-hand side of the molecule flips around. And when it does that, it excites the chemical, the old chemical sensing molecule and sends an impulse uh, up the nerve. And so this grand mutation 540 million years ago, changing a chemical sensor to an optical sensor was the beginning of the sense of vision on planet Earth. And it was by complete accident. And today we still have this mutation. It's in every cell in the retina of our eyes and the eyes of every other creature on planet Earth. Now it's quite an, quite an amazing thing to have happened. And it was uh, evolution, uh, act, evidence suggests that evolution reinvented this thing 40 or 65 times quite independently. It was such a valuable mutation that it gave animals the ability, simple creatures, the ability to understand uh, something about their world based on the way the world reflected light. And then quite quickly, multi-celled organisms came and they had more complicated eyes with more than just one light sensor, with a bunch of light sensors arranged in a concave cup. And that gave them the ability to see not just light and dark, but the direction that light came from. They could start to see shapes and forms and adapt their motion to what it is that they saw. So that allowed them to become either much better predators because they could see prey or for prey creatures, it gave them the ability to see a predator coming and run away or hide. And then by 520 million years ago, we had quite complex creatures like trilobites, they dominated oceans for nearly 300 million years and they had a very early compound eye. And then today, 
there are 10 different eye designs today on planet Earth, and almost all creatures have eyes. The only creatures that don't are the ones that live very deep underground where there is no light. So it's a solution to, to the problems of life uh, that's been widely adopted uh, across all life forms on Earth. If you sort of think of the things that we can do with our sense of vision, it's quite extraordinary. Uh, we can do something simple like thread a needle. Uh, we can do something like driving. And when you think about a driving task, really what we're doing is looking at the road and everything around us. It goes in, into our brain through our eyes. We make some plans and we move our hands and our feet in order to control the car. The jugglers that you see down the bottom are using their eyes to not only see where the objects are that they're juggling, but to predict where those objects will be in the future. Because the, the, the key to successful juggling is not where things are now, it's where they will be in the future. So our sense of a vision is very much coupled with our ability to predict the short-term future. And that has got amazing benefits for the survival of creatures. Uh, so I'm continually amazed at the, the capabilities of the human visual system. Now, humans also use our experience. Uh, so as we, we grow up and we learn about how the world works, uh, we are able to uh, resolve tricks like this. So uh, this video on, on, the, on the right, I'm afraid, is not running. But these sorts of tricks that kind of amuse us, uh, we can use our rational brain to understand what's actually going on, that they're problems of perspective uh, that we've used to trick the eye. We've also know things like on the on the left hand side, we know that those dark marks on the ground, the shadows, we know that they're not a real thing, that we can walk through them, that they won't hurt us. They're just an artifact of light. We know that these converging lines in the middle are actually parallel. And we know that the oval shaped wheel on the right hand side, we know that it's a circle. We just know that if you look at a circle from a particular viewpoint, it looks like an oval. And so we've got deep knowledge in our brains about how images are formed, the relationship between what's in the world and what it is that we, we see through our eyes. We also have an amazing ability to tune out the variation in appearance. So we know without even thinking about it that these are all cups. You know, and they're different shaped cups, different viewpoints, and some are full and some are empty. We just know they're cups. But their appearance, when you think about it, are radically different. And these are the sorts of things that are real challenges for robots, taking pictures, analyzing the pictures and trying to understand what's there. The things that I've just shown you that humans do effortlessly, we still struggle to do with robots and artificial intelligence. So here's an example of uh, left to right. These are the same place, but at different times of the day and from a slightly different location. And if we look at this for just a second or two, we can figure that out. Again, very difficult to, to train a robot to do that. And another thing that I think is fascinating about the way humans do vision is that the eyes, our eyes are driven by the highest performing muscles in our bodies. They're capable of amazing speed and acceleration. And so even if we're just sitting still, our eyes are darting all over the world looking at different things. They're not just taking a picture, our eye is actively moving over the scene. And people have done studies where you put a device on the person's head, a test subject's head, that checks, that tracks where it is that they're looking. And then you can ask people a question. And what's really interesting is the way their eyes move depends on the question that you ask them. So this very famous study on the left-hand side, we've asked the subject, what are the ages of the people in the picture? And so the person's eyes are looking at the faces of the humans, trying to see if they're sort of wrinkly or, or beardy or whether, they're, whether they look young and fresh faced. The other picture is, the question was, what's the material circumstances of the family? And so the person's eye, and this is completely unconscious, is checking out the furniture, it's checking out the paintings on the wall, it's looking for jewelry, and the quality of the clothing. And this is completely unconscious. Your brain is answering questions by choosing where to look in the world. And this is a trick that robots don't yet do. And I really think that they should. So when you think about what we call seeing, it's very complicated. We use our memory of the world to help us see. We also use our seeing to create memories. We understand the context of what we're looking at. I know that I'm in a room right now. And because I'm in a room, there are some things that I expect to see some things I don't expect to see. How do I know what context I'm in? 
I use my sense of vision to establish the context and the context helps me see better. Uh, sometimes I move my head in order to see better. If there's, an if there's an obstacle in the way, I move my head to, uh, to, to look around that. So moving helps me see, but seeing also helps me move. It gives me my, a large part of my sense of balance comes from, comes from my eyes. So over the last 20 years, uh, researchers in AI in a particular field called computer vision have been trying to replicate human visual capability. And they've made great progress. So nowadays, if you've got your photos stored in Google Photos, uh, you can put in a keyword like ships and back will come all the pictures from your photo album about ships. So Google search engine can make a mapping between the word ships and pictures of ships. We have algorithms now that can take streams of imagery, find all the objects within that imagery and label them. Not 100% accurately, but sufficiently accurately and do it very, very quickly. We have algorithms now that can take a picture and write a caption for it. So what you see, the text underneath each picture is being created by an AI. It's a very concise summary of what's inside the picture. The AI doesn't understand the picture, but it's able to produce some text which accurately depicts what's going on in the picture. AI can uh, infer or imagine the skeletons of human beings, which is useful if you want to try and understand how people are standing with respect to the robot. We can figure the gender and age of people. We can imagine the depth in the scene. So the bottom picture here, things that are bright are close to me and things that are dark are further away. So it's imagining the three-dimensional structure of the world from a strictly two-dimensional picture that we see at the top. In this picture, the bottom image, the pixels have been color coded according to what sort of object they are. So the pink represents ground, blue represents a car, red represents a human being. And so this is very valuable information from a robot because a robot doesn't really care what color something is. A robot cares what the meaning of the thing is. And you know the ground is something you can drive on, the pedestrians are something you cannot drive on, and buildings are something you cannot drive in. So we've it, created greater level of meaning about the world uh, through what we call semantic segmentation. Here's an example from some colleagues of mine looking at this problem of how do you match places even though they appear to be differently. So we've driven along this road several times, once in the daytime and once at night when it's raining. And we can match our place along the road, even though it looks different, sun's gone down and it's raining, and we can just effortlessly move backwards and forwards in these two video sequences and match them exactly. Here again is some examples of work with shadows that I mentioned earlier. Top pictures, uh, color pictures with shadows, and down the bottom is a computer vision algorithm that's removed the shadows. Uh, so they no longer distract us. Here is an example. Oh, sorry, let me go back to that one. This video. I'm sorry that that's not playing, but the, the video on the previous slide was just showing a, a self-driving car moving through the, the streets of San Francisco, uh, demonstrating very, very high levels of performance. Um, what we see here is that the way a lot of these self-driving cars today are visualizing the world is using not cameras, not anything like our eyes. They use other sorts of sensors where they reflect laser beams off everything in the world and create real three-dimensional images of the world directly. But Tesla uh, has gone sort of against the current and they have a lot of cameras in their car. So what you see in the right-hand side of this is the views from the many cameras, from some of the many cameras in the Tesla. And this is sort of how the, the Tesla uh, autopilot is visualizing the world. It's seeing objects, it's putting boxes around them, reasoning about them, where are they now, where will they be in the future, and using that to inform its driving process. Here's an example of a robot that we built uh, at our lab. Uh, this is a robot for weeding. Uh, so it's a large robot for uh, re removing weeds in uh, large scale outdoor agriculture. So this is what the robot sees as it's driving over the ground. It's got cameras looking down and it can detect the difference, can classify individual plants and say, this plant is a weed uh, and this plant is a crop. This is a good plant and this is a bad plant. And once we have that information, then we can selectively spray the, the bad plants using chemicals. Or more interestingly, what we can do is to uh, actually mechanically dig the weed out of the ground. So we can actually use the computer vision system to recognize the weed and then control the mechanical thing to dig the weed out of the ground. 
a bit like a human farmer would do with a hoe, uh, but now this is all completely automated. This is another robot that we developed in our lab, and this is for harvesting uh, sweet peppers, capsicums, uh, bell peppers. Uh, so the robot is looking at the fruit. There's a camera on the end of the robot. It's taking a few different views. And on the left-hand side, you can see the robot's conception of the scene. Uh, it can recognize the fruit very clearly in that. It figures out the right way to move, to approach it, grabs it, moves in, cuts the stalk, and is, ends up with uh, the, the fruit uh, hanging in its hand. So this is a single-handed cut uh, of the fruit. And humans generally do this using two hands. Our robots are able to do it with just a single hand. So I know I've gone very quickly and covered a lot of things. Uh, if there's any sort of take home message here, it is that the sense of a vision, if you think of it as a technology, a biological technology, it's 540 million years old. And almost all animals have got a really strong reliance on vision. And it's my very firm belief that we, can, we could create robots that are as effective and capable as humans uh, with, just two, with just two cameras and the right sort of brain. And so we've got two cameras and a brain and labels to do so many things. We can build robots with two cameras, that's easy. What we don't have yet is the right sort of brain. We don't have the right computing architectures and we don't have the right algorithms running in that brain uh, that give us the power, the versatility, the ability to learn that we have. Uh, but I think within the next 10 years, we will absolutely see that happen. So the challenge for us right now is how to develop those algorithms that will run, create the brain of future visually enabled robots. On the left-hand side, there are some books uh, that I found very enjoyable. I'm an engineer, not a biologist, uh, but I find the biological stuff fascinating. And uh, some books that I've enjoyed reading, uh, very, very approachable uh, and absolutely fascinating. I will stop there. Thank you. And I'm very happy to take questions. Thank you so much, um, Professor. That was really interesting. Um, are you able to hear me? Yes, I can. Very well. Okay, wonderful. I just wanted to say that the visuals that you used in your entire, entire, entire talk, they were so interesting. And I'm, I'm so glad that we had the opportunity to actually see these videos while you were talking, because we were able to relate with so many things. And I especially like the example of how you started with Google Photos in order to explain computer vision. And I think it was a really beautiful seeing the way the robot was uh, uh, picking out the bell peppers in your farm. That was really fascinating. Um, and I mean, there are a bunch of questions that we've got with very little time right. left. So here, Fire away. yeah. So here it goes. So the first question that we have here is: This person, our attendee, has obviously gone through your website. Uh, they say, <laughs> "Could you shed some light on your work in large-scale environmental monitoring and agriculture?" Sure. So I touched a little bit about on the work we've done in agriculture, and this is uh, yeah, a weeding robot and a fruit picking robot. We've also done work with drones uh, and multispectral cameras to look for things like crop disease and crop yield. Uh, and you know, there's many people around the world working on, on that because you can cover a lot of ground very quickly from a drone. And with the right sorts of sensors on the, gr on the drone, you can learn a lot about crop health. We've also had projects uh, using all sorts of different vehicles for environmental monitoring. One of my colleagues uh, had a project to count koalas in trees. Now, koalas are very hard animals to see and they don't move very much. But with an infrared camera on a drone, you can see them as little warm things all through the tops of the tree. So it makes them, it reveals them and makes it possible to count them. Uh, we've also done some work on surveying uh, marine mammals. Uh, in, in Queensland, we have these things, we call them dugongs. Uh, sometimes they're known as manatees. Uh, yeah. And they're a, a little bit endangered, but from drones, uh, they live in shallow water. So from drones, we can recognize them and count them. Another of my colleagues has been doing work uh, on surveying coral reefs uh, using underwater robots. So, you know, there is, our environment is in such a, in such terrible shape that uh, I think robots provide a very cost-effective way to understand the state of our environment. If you like to bench line it, 
bench market, right? This is the state of the environment now. Are we trending up or are we trending down? Uh, so I think robots have a huge role to play there. Wonderful. I think my favorite bit about these talks are when uh, our researcher is able to explain the exact use of their research in uh, the field. And mm -hmm. you put it so beautifully across. So thank you for answering that question. Okay, so the next question that we have for you here is, if robots cannot see, how can they be used in healthcare? For example, how do we trust surgical robots? That's a good question. The surgical robots that we have today are actually not autonomous. So it isn't that you push the button on the robot and it replaces your knee. Uh, the robots that do surgery right now are teleoperated. So generally it's like in you, there's a camera uh, looking at the surgical site. That camera information is relayed to a human surgeon who is using their surgeon brain to control some joysticks, which control the robot doing the surgery. So there's very definitely a human with very good visual capability and fantastic medical skills uh, doing the work. So maybe in sometime in the future, robots have got sufficient vi vi visual skill to be able to do it all by themselves. But I think that's a long way off. Right now we rely on humans. Perfect. So uh, the next question would be, so are robots completely dependent on artificial intelligence, deep learning, machine learning, or are they, can they, function independently of these uh, fields. So if I got my backup slide here, yeah, to me, the fields of artificial intelligence and robotics are very closely related. So to my mind, a robot is an artificial intelligence with a body. So a lot of artificial intelligence just lives in a computer. So it eats data and it emits data. Everything's virtual. Uh, it's a cyber entity. But when you put the AI into a body so that it can affect the world, it can move within the world, it can pick things up in the move in the world and put them down again, then it's a robot. So this to me is the connect the relationship between AI and, and robotics. All right, definitely. Uh, they are interrelated as you rightly uh, suggested. So mm. um, what are the other senses that can be incorporated in robots? So we've been working on uh, vision, but what about touch, taste, smell, listening? How, how, how is that research coming along? Uh, there are researchers around the world working on all of those things. Uh, so if you go to a robotics conference, there will be whole sessions on robot audition. That's its ability to hear. People have done taste and smell. Uh, touch is a very important one for robots because we, as I've talked a lot about using our sense of vision, uh, we also rely a lot on our sense of touch. So when I pick something up with my hand, I use my eyes to guide my hand there. The actual closing and grasping of the object is completely mediated by uh, tactile perception. So tactile perception touch is very important. Then also as roboticists, we create sensors that are beyond beyond human. So these sensors that bounce laser beams off things, they can measure exact distances. And our eyes are not really capable of measuring exact distance. So I can tell this thing is closer than that thing, but I can't, I, with my eyes, I can't tell you a distance to millimeters. But robots can have laser sensors that can do that. Robots can have radars. Robots can have cameras that can see ultraviolet and infrared, uh, that instead of just three color channels like we have in our eyes, they could have a hundred color channels. So yeah, we can accept sell on this, uh, beat the sorts of senses that, that we humans have. Oh, wonderful. That was uh, definitely um, very encouraging to think about <laughs> what, <laughs> what are the different ways that robots can be in, in a way, say, humanized in the future. So, okay. Mm. So the next question that we have here is, um, so they say, can you tell us something about your work in swarm robotics? So swarm robotics is not something that I do, uh, but it is, uh, it is an, yet another research area in, in robotics. And it's motivated by the sorts of behaviors that we see in nature. So we see schools of fish and we see flocks of birds uh, and swarms of insects. And generally with this, you get some collective intelligence. You have individual, you have individual entities that are intelligent to a lesser extent, and they can sense each other but in the way they interact with each other, you get a, uh, 
another whole level of behavior beyond the indiv- what the individual can do. And it's very, it's very fascinating. And there are certainly a lot of people who, who, who work in this. And, uh, but it's not, that's not me. All right. Uh, no worries. Uh, so is there any way that robots can help in mining? Mining as in extraction of resources yeah. or yeah. in laying landmines? Uh, in extraction of resources. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, yes, in Australia, there's been huge interest in, in robotics for, for the mining industry. Uh, part of the reason for that is that Australia is a high labor cost country. And so if you can have a, a machine that's driven by an AI, if it's effectively a robot, then there are productivity wins. Uh, you, can, you can do the work for a lower cost. And for some mining environments, particularly underground mining, it's very dangerous. So it's one of those occupations where every year, sadly, a number of people will be killed at work in mining. And so, you know, it's a good thing if you put robots underground or in these dangerous situations rather than rather than human beings. If the robot gets crushed, well, you just write it off. Uh, it's not so easy with, with a human. So there is huge interest for the productivity uh, benefit and also for the safety benefit. So the biggest instance of robots uh, in the mining industry is, is trucks. So in big uh, open pit uh, mines in Australia, particularly the iron ore mines in the west of Australia, huge trucks, you know, carrying hundreds of tons of ore, uh, uh, completely autonomous. They look like a tr- like a truck, like a like a hu- human driven truck, uh, but they are driving. Many of them are driving themselves these days. I did uh, a project well, almost two decades ago now on underground vehicles. So they're like smaller trucks that can move through underground mine tunnels. Uh, again, uh, to take human beings out of risky environments so the mining industry is such a big industry it's got such huge turnover that if you can improve their productivity by say one percent that translates immediately into hundreds of millions of dollars per year Uh, so there is a real incentive to uptake that technology into mining industry Definitely. That's very interesting. As you rightly put, it's such a uh, it's such an important but such a broad uh, topic. I mean, the entire industry is so uh, wide. There are multiple applications, but one has to see how robotics can exactly fit in. Hmm. And with that, I'll come to my next question. Uh, so the question here is quite interesting. So if we are enabling robots to see uh, during daytime, how are robots being adapted to see in the dark? It's a really good question. Uh, so in the dark, they are essentially just as uh, just as useless as we are. Uh, our eyes are actually remarkably good. If we let our eyes adapt to the dark, you know, it takes a long time. It takes maybe you know 15, 20 minutes to get properly dark adapted, and we have to eat a lot of carrots. But if we do all those things, then we're able to actually perceive almost individual photons. Our eyes are actually extraordinarily sensitive. Now, there are cameras uh, that are available commercially now that are very, very sensitive. So they can, we have cameras in our lab that you can go into a dark room and take a picture with this camera and I can't see anything, but the camera takes a picture. It's not a great picture, it's a bit noisy, but you know, they are, they are, they are happening. Of course, the, the cheap alternative is you just put headlights on the robot, like we do with a car. Uh, or we can use very sensitive cameras, or some mixture of some mixture of both. Well, that definitely does answer the question. And okay, so the next question that we have here is: um, How do we find out if robots are becoming intelligent day by day? And is there a chance that robots will actually take over our lives in the future? Look, it's a really good question. And I have to say, I don't think anybody knows knows the answer. As somebody who's worked with robots for a very long time now, I think I've got a particularly low opinion of what robots can do. And I think all the people in my lab have got a very low opinion of, of what robots can do. And that's really at odds with the opinion that many people in the general public have, because they've been all they know about is what fiction tells them. And so there's this big difference between what general public see and fear versus, you know, at the moment, what we know robots are capable of. So, you know, a roboticist will joke that if there's a robot uprising, all you have to do is shut the door. 
because the moment robots can't open doors. But you know, in <laughs> but that's not always going to be the case. And as computing power continues to improve, as these AI systems continue to learn, and the difference about robot learning compared to human learning is when we're born, we know almost nothing. We spend, you know, 20 more years getting to be competent, right? We learn some skills and all sorts of things. We have a useful life and then we die, right? It's very wasteful, actually. The thing with robots is if their intelligence is all in the cloud, right? One robot learns something, every robot's learned that thing. One robot has a surprise, a new experience. Potentially, every robot has that new experience. A robot gets scrapped uh, or dies. Well, its knowledge is not lost. And so what there is potentially is this sort of information ratchet or a knowledge ratchet. It will never go backwards. They will always just get more and more intelligent, which is something biological organisms can never compete. Uh, so I think it is inevitable that they will become smarter than us. Whether they become malign uh, and turn on us, I don't know. Uh, it will depend a lot on, I guess, the people who, who create them and what guidelines are put in place. It is a conversation we're starting to have, but we probably, even in my field of people who do robotics as a profession, I think we could do more. Uh, so we need to be having conversations with the public. We need to be having conversations with ethicists and all sorts of other folk to make sure that we don't create uh, yet another bad, dangerous technology, uh, which you know, we're very good at doing, unfortunately. <laughs> no, that was uh, that was definitely very interesting. I particularly like the point that you made about how uh, robots are portrayed in cinema and media, which mm. sort of makes us uh, assume the worst. And we, we start thinking about the worst case scenario that there's an uprising and robots are taking over our lives. And a yeah. lot of our thinking is, uh, you know, motivated by what we see on the big screen. But um, yeah. you know, that brings me to my next question. This is probably going to be the last two questions that I post to you. So um, the question would be, uh, what is your opinion on the ethical standpoint of AI and robotics? And uh, do robotics, uh, do, do researchers in this field have conversations on ethics surrounding AI and robotics every single day? How is that shaping up? It's not... It's sort of related to the previous question. Uh, I think that there is much more that we can do, but we are starting to, to pay attention to this. Uh, it, there is a particular area of robotics that has probably garnered the most attention, and that's what is, is known as lethal autonomous weapon systems. So this is, you could imagine a robot and you program this robot to find a particular person and kill them. It's a bit like a Terminator movie plot. Uh, you know, so these are things that are intelligent and use their intelligence to to harm humans. So there is a movement uh, action in the United Nations to ban this entire class of weapons, uh, yeah. lethal autonomous weapon systems. Yeah. Uh, there will be some countries that will opt out uh, of that, of that, uh, but that certainly is a is a current conversation and probably the one that's, if you like, that that's most advanced in terms of. Uh, trying to mitigate the worst things that that robots could do to to humankind, but there are many other. There's the impact on the impact on on jobs. There's impact on education. Uh, you know, should we be having our young should young children be taught by robots? Uh, should old people be looked after by robots? Uh, so many, so many questions. What happens to the data that robots gather? Does it all go up into some super robot cloud? Who, who, who's got access and who controls, who sees all that information? Because robots with eyes that are going around, they're seeing everything and recording it. Uh, so we need to put in place protections against against that. So there's a lot of work to a lot of work to do. Rightly said, sir. Uh, very, very important topic that we need to address as we further. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. you know, advance ahead in technology. And I think with that, I would uh, like to ask you the final question uh, that we tend to ask all our researchers and scientists. Um, sir, what do you think is the role of public engagement platforms like India Science Festival in promoting and uh, creating a pathway uh, to bring together science and society? What role does uh, this play in bringing forward credible science to the public? 
I think it's it's critically important. Uh, I, I enjoy speaking at festivals and I've spoken at film festivals and folk festivals and things like that. I think you reach an audience that is that that is interested in engaging uh, or engaged. Uh, but I also think that scientists are not very good at disseminating what they do, to be honest. Uh, you know, and we tend to to, to speak in, in 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 cryptic ways and in code to our peers, and we essentially we are we're funded by 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 society. You know, I'm a, I'm a university academic. My salary comes from the public purse, so I owe it to the public to explain what it is that we're doing. A lot of academics don't like that, or they feel uncomfortable doing that. But I think it's a really important role that academics. Uh, researchers of all kinds, uh, you know, do, and and festivals are a way to 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 encourage that, and get us to speak in what in ways that are hopefully more accessible or more understandable than you know the way we would normally speak at uh, at the conferences that we that we go to. So I think they I think it's wonderful. Thank you so much. I mean, you know, uh, from from someone who is currently in India and is getting to uh, hear you speak. I truly believe that this platform has given a lot of our attendees the opportunity to actually uh, engage with a renowned researcher like you. And I think that is the best part about all of this, that we have actually managed to uh, hear you speak live at the same time you could answer so many questions for us. And that just brought you a lot closer to our society than otherwise we could have expected. So thank Absolutely. you so much. It's, it's my pleasure. Thank you very much for inviting me. Thanks very much to the audience for their wonderful questions. Okay, thank oh, you. Thank you so much, Professor. It was such an honor having you at India Science Festival. Uh, really grateful for the time that you took out to be with us and thank you for patiently answering all these questions. You are indeed an example of how scientists can take uh, initiatives to engage with society. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Yeah, bye-bye. Thank you to all our attendees uh, for sticking around and listening to the entire talk presented by Professor Peter Cork all the way from Australia. Now, as I mentioned at the very beginning of my uh, introduction, we have a lot of interesting talks panel discussions, games, demonstrations, and workshops lined across the entire month of January. So make sure that you stick around for all of our events. You can head over to our um, website and check out all the events that we have and uh, make sure that you register for the events that appeal to you. Uh, for those of you who would uh, like to send us our, uh, your feedback, we want to improve in the coming weeks and we want to make sure that this festival is better and more accessible to you. And uh, we will, uh, I have put together a, a message on your chat. So if you could just take out two minutes of your time and fill in uh, the feedback form that you can find in your chat, uh, we would be grateful to know your opinion. And we also have a lot of social media competitions going on on our channels. So request you all to, um, participate in those and win exciting prizes. And now we have a very, very interesting competition which has been um, much awaited throughout the month of uh, January. It is the Science Just a Minute or Jam competition. And I think my friend Abhimanyu will be taking over from here. So if I could just request uh, Abhimanyu to come on screen. Okay. Thanks, Abhimanyu. I'm going to sign off from here. Thank you so much, Ruti, for that introduction. Uh, the last talk was wonderful and it concluded very well. Uh, to all of those who are present here, I am Abhimanyu. I would be a jam master for the evening. And I know that this has been one of the most awaited events of the festival. And uh, here it is. So I guess I'm as excited to moderate this as you are to take a part in it. So first of all, a little bit about JAM, or like what this event is all about. And I guess I would like to give all of you an idea what you're going to witness here today. So uh, as all of you know, this event has got to do with speaking. 
and uh, speaking is something like which i'm very interested in uh, like public speaking is one of my forte and one thing that i've observed over the years is that like it is very easy to speak on a topic that you get some time to prepare on to research about like personally if you can give me 24 hours to speak and like to prepare on any topic i can go and speak in front of any crowd in the world and i guess that is true for most of the people who are into this field but what if you don't get any time what if you get a topic and you have to like just straight away speak on it for one minute that is the premise of this entire competition and uh, i guess today we are going to test your ability to think spontaneously to be creative to think on your feet and uh, let's see how you perform so before we begin i would like to introduce you uh, to uh, to you our esteemed judge uh, usha venkat raman ma'am usha ma'am is an award winning international performance storyteller she is an educationist a classical vocalist uh, she hails from mumbai india and like her forte is weaving magic with her words she's got marvelous puppetry skills that like make her tales even more fascinating guys you've got to listen to her speak i'm telling you she has performed in like india and like abroad as well she's a featured storyteller uh, she also founded mumbai storyteller society mss uh, for those of you who don't know about it that's an initiative that she says is born out of her zeal to keep the oral tradition alive usha ma'am we are honored to have you here as our guest and thank you so much for agreeing to be the judge of this event so hello ma'am uh, would you like to like speak a few words and address our participants i would like i would like to uh, hear from you very much and i guess we hello. all would thank you abhimanyu for inviting me as a judge i look hello. forward to it and let's listen to the participants speak yeah. and tell their one minute story Yeah, I look yeah. forward to it. Thank you so much, ma'am. I guess you'll have as much of a wonderful time as we would, and I guess as a contestant would in participating in this event. So, with that, with uh, with the introduction of the ma'am, let's kick off this event, and uh, uh, let me just share my screen with all of you. okay so i hope my screen is visible to everybody who is present and uh, so this is the smo 2021 science champ and like earlier i had i was thinking of preparing a couple of guidelines for this event and i thought what uh, would be more bet- what would be uh, better than to just write the entire gist of this event in two lines this is what this event is essentially about you get a topic on the spot and you have to speak on it for one minute that's it that is what this boils down to so uh, i guess all of you are ready to kick off this event we recognize that uh, all of you are not here to might not be here to participate some of you are here to just like sit back and enjoy the show to just be a part of the audience so what we are going to do is in order to find out who all of you are interested in registering as a participant we are going to open up the chat window for a period of 30 seconds right guys at this point i want all of you to focus on your chat windows right now it should be disabled but pretty soon when i say so we are going to open it up for 30 seconds at that point all those of you who are willing to participate who are interested in participating should write your name and your age in in one single message and shoot it off to us right so you have to send just one message it should contain your name and your age you send that one message to us and that's it you are done that would tell you that uh, you are interested in participating and we would schedule your one minute session uh, those of you who are here just as audience like if you think you like if you think you want you're up for this then you can also like do this Uh, or otherwise if you just want to enjoy the show you don't have to do anything at this stage you can just sit back and relax so uh, can we open the chat window now please yeah so it is open right now 
you can send us your name and your age oh that count that counter is going up quite quite fast i must say well i'm very excited to see that we have already crossed 30 entries that's good yeah so we'll keep it open like for another 10 seconds and then we are going to close it if you are like feeling on the edge should i uh, do this should i not i would like suggest that you just go for it let's see what happens come on guys okay entries are still coming in all right let's close the window now i guess everybody who wanted to join is in all right so yes all the registrants are in uh, and we are going to schedule our sessions now uh, my team is going to be on that all right and uh, like uh, we should give them a couple of minutes to prep the stuff uh, in the meantime i can take i th i guess a couple of questions and answers regarding this event so guys uh, if you have any questions related to this event like what uh, how it is going to take place what would be the format or anything that you want to ask me your moderator you can simply shoot of your query in the q and a uh, window on this chat Uh, not on the chat i'm sorry on the q and a window that is separately there in the zoom call uh let me just pause the share and take up a couple of your questions all right we have a question on how long this event is going to take place uh so this would end at 6 pm so it's almost an hour and a half 15 minutes long event how long am i get uh, getting to speak okay so i'm going to get 1 minute to speak that is in the topic jam just a minute that is what it stands for uh do we need to switch off the camera yes that's a very good question so if you are a contestant if you have registered your name uh, once we kick off the event uh it's not compulsory that you turn off turn on your camera so you can keep it off or you can keep it on it is totally up to you your turning on your audio is obviously compulsory but video that is totally up to you all right i guess uh, most of the questions are around this sir i don't know how to turn on the audio okay so yeah this is important and i guess we can take some time to specially check this so those of you who have resubmitted your names i want you to do one thing you should go to your zoom window uh, at the bottom like at the bottom half of the screen you are going to see a microphone button so i want you to turn it on i want you to see that it is not crossed off that it is on and if possible i want you to test your audio right now so that uh, once it's your turn to speak the event goes on without any hitch so please take a few seconds and just make sure that your audio is turned on your microphone is turned on basically yeah all right okay so it's officially time to begin we have a first contestant but before we uh, call the first contestant on here on here to speak uh, i want uh, to explain one more thing if you have submitted your name i want you to very closely monitor your chat window so what is going to happen is that at any point of time uh, somebody from our team will reach you out they'll reach out to you and give you your topic right so that topic would uh, be sent to you on a private message on your chat so i want you to constantly monitor your chat so that you don't miss the messages 
right guys all right so i guess with that let me introduce you to our first contestant uh the name of the first content contestant is uh rito brata i think so it is a bit difficult to pronounce am i saying that correctly uh, yeah it's rito brata oh rito brata i'm so sorry to mispronounce that i guess that is like some cultural difference that is taking place here yeah yeah that's fine that's fine <laughs> yeah. that's fine so rito how are you feeling are you confident nervous Yeah, well, I, I'm I'm not very much into public speaking. I've never spoken before, but I thought I'd just join in for fun. Well, that is so impressive, and at the same time, so inspiring. See, this is what it's all about. Like, it's not your ability to speak, like how good of a public speaker you are, or anything. It is about your courage, your confidence, and whether you can do what Rito just did here. So she's here to speak, and let's start her one minute. So Rito, I'll uh, display your topic on the screen, and. Yeah. So the topic is. Yeah. Right. This one. You wake up in the middle of the night to go drink some water and find your dog sitting at your laptop typing in some command. On seeing you, he quickly switches the window. That is your topic. Right. So, brother, your time starts now. Go. Okay. First thing I do is I go up to him and ask him, Tommy, how on earth are you typing with your paws? Even if I'm having fingers, and still then I it took me a lot of time to get myself adjusted to my laptop. How on earth are you typing with your paws? And how on earth are you con controlling the mouse to uh, do and do like switching your windows and doing all things? And then he looks up at me. Of course, he can't speak even though he can use the laptop. And he suddenly gives an expression that looks very much like a smile and said, "Come on, we dogs can do better than you human beings can. Uh, you just uh, underestimate us anyway." And so then I try to find out uh, what were you actually watching and why do you quickly switch the window? And then he said, and then I force him to open up. What? Come on, what are you watching? And he opens up the window, and I. See that like he's created a special page and all where the, all the dogs are there and it's he says oh this is like our dog book kind of thing like you do Facebook now this is a dog book where all the dogs are and uh, the, we all join and this is our very private the social media platform and I said okay fine go on with whatever you're doing just don't get addicted like we are already addicted to this thing and they said then no no. we are not like you human beings we can we have a certain self control and uh, so then yeah. i start exploring dog Rito, book i guess that is your time so that's I, it i start exploring dog I, book i just want to ask you one thing yeah are you sure you've never spoken never spoken in public before no i really haven't in school we well, we well, teachers used to ask her that speak on something and that's all not not like public speaking and anything I have to give it to you. That was like that was brilliant. The content was point on. It was creative. Your answer, and I'm like really impressed with the way you delivered your entire Thank one you. minute challenge. Thank you. Thank All you. Thank you right. so much. Thank you so much, Rita. So, guys, it's time to move on to our next contestant. Next up, we have Richa. Do we have Richa here? Yes. Hi. Hi, Hi Richa. Everyone. Hi, hi. So, how are you? First of all, yeah, I'm fine, and I'm very excited to be part of this. You know, I always keep on looking uh, for this kind of events where I can speak out and I can, you know, like take... there are so many people. I'm getting to know a lot of things. It's nice. It's yeah, just yeah. a wonderful experience, and this is really you must have given me this opportunity. <laughs> Definitely. Like uh, personally, I have often felt that once you speak in one such event, we have we have to do something like this, like just go on the mm -hmm. stage and start speaking. So for the next week, week and a half, I keep feeling confident. I don't know why. Like if I can do something that takes us most of much of courage, I can handle anything else. So that is how I feel. So yeah, without further true. ado, right, right. So without further ado, here is your question. You're gazing at the night sky, and suddenly the moon explodes. That's the topic. Go. Yeah, so it uh, it is going to be a romantic night, and I'm just gazing at the night sky. Oh my God, what a beautiful view! And suddenly the moon explodes, and uh, I am like, and everyone around me is get is panicked. Why? What is happening right there? And uh, as I'm a very I'm a space enthusiast, I would go, uh, I'll go to my laboratory and I'll uh, try to understand. And I have my own telescope. so i'll go and i'll try to gaze uh, at this uh, 
moon, uh, the sky, and I'll try to analyze that it's really moon exploding or there's something else. And I, uh, so as I'm very uh, fascinated by this, all around the world there's a rumor that yeah, the moon has exploded, and now Earth is without uh, its natural satellite. But as I'm uh, something, somebody who wouldn't believe anyone. So I make my own spaceship, and I would go to space and try to think, uh, try to find out the real uh, reason for it. And uh, as I go to the into the space, I uh, discover a new, uh, uh, some new object, or you kind of say, new cosmic body, just way more similar to moon. And I go there, I land there, and uh, after landing in that uh, planet, not planet correctly, a moon-like object. I see that it is just a replica of Earth, and after go and replica of Earth, when I land on that uh, um, uh, satellite, like moon-like object, Racha, there, uh, so, uh, your story is fascinating, definitely. Like, but I'll have to interrupt you at this point because your minute is like was up like ten seconds ago. But I, but I was so engrossed with your story that oh, I didn't have oh. to interrupt you. <laughs> oh, but that is true. <laughs> I like the way it started off with romance and then it culminated into this entire thing about scientific curiosity and you were quite the explorer for a minute there. So very well done, I would say. Thank you. Thank you so much. I wish you had more time. But thank you so much for taking part. Thank you so much. Okay. So uh, next up, we have Ashmi Aaron. Ashmi, are you yes, there? Sir. Yes, sir. Hi, Ashmi. Hi, sir. How is it going? So it's uh, really fine over here. Was this a planned thing or did you just stumble into this event? Like, were you planning on taking part on this jam session? Since... Well, I was planning and yesterday I tried okay. to, but I had a lot of school stuff going on. So I couldn't take part yesterday. But I then uh, got to know that today is also it's happening. It's recurring. So I, I thought understand. now I... Uh, I'll take part. I'll surely take part. Today. Ms. Ashmi, thank you so much for taking time out of your busy schedule. And I know how tough schools are these days with online yes, classes yes. and everything. So uh, without further ado again, here is your topic. You just found out that your cat is an alien from outer space. Oh, wow. That is a good topic. Please go. Uh, I was petting my cat uh, in my living room so far and I, I just uh, heard a particular sound uh, uh, in, at my window and I just opened my window to see what it was and I saw it was a spaceship. I thought it was a spaceship and what happened was that my cat just jumped and entered the spaceship without the door opening and the next moment I was in the spaceship too. I was really, I just really felt awkward that what was happening uh, and I stopped Stumble upon my cat who was turning into a particular object. I didn't know what it was, but suddenly it started talking in, uh, in a, a awkward language which I never heard before. It was uh, sounding something like Chinese. And by the way, I sometimes think that Chinese are also aliens, but okay, let's uh, put that apart. So it was speaking something like Chinese. I thought it was Chinese and I tried to speak something like Chinese too. Kang Kong Kai. And <laughs> nothing happened actually. But <laughs> she just looked at, uh, look, like stared at me and uh, started to say in English that, hey, I didn't call you here. Huh? Why mean... are you in my spaceship? And I thought, what? Your spaceship? You are in? And she said, um... Ashmi, yeah, I was. Ashmi, I'm sorry, I'll have to interrupt you here, but uh, <laughs> it was almost as if you were speaking from experience. I won't lie. Has it ever happened to you that your cat did this? <laughs> I haven't ever get, got a pet, uh, pet. And actually now I'm chumming a lot. <laughs> no, no, it's totally okay. Your story was great. And you used your one minute very well. And like I'm very happy to have you here. Thank you so much, Ashmi, for participating. Thank you, sir. All right. So next up, we have Chahat Chabra. Uh, Chahat, are you here? Yes, sir. Good evening, okay. sir. Good evening. Uh, how are you feeling, first of all? 
uh, I am feeling very nice. Actually, my house is under construction, so if there is some background noise, please uh, once, excuse that. <laughs> once again, that is totally okay. We are here to hear your story, and we are not going to let any background noises of construction or anything stop you. Like if even if a meteorite was falling in your backyard, <laughs> even that wouldn't stop us from listening to you. So okay, here is your topic. Yes. You discovered proof that we are living in a simulation, but 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 no one is ready to believe you. What do you do? Go. Can can you repeat it once? You discover proof that we are living in a simulation, but no one is ready to believe you. Right. Uh. So, uh, can you? I, I'm not uh, able to get that. I'm not able to interpret it. Did, okay. Did our team share this topic with you? I just want to make sure that there isn't any discrepancy. No. 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 you didn't okay all right uh so i'll like uh, can you see it on my screen right now uh no okay no. nothing is visible right, right. you discover I'll... proof that you are living in a yeah. simulation but no one is ready to believe you mm -hmm. uh okay right now i get it you discover proof that we are living in a simulation but no one okay so uh i uh, one day i was sitting uh, and uh, i was talking to myself uh, then came in someone who saw me that i was blabbering about so no one was ready uh, so they thought that i have a multiple personality disorder but they did not understand what i was going through so uh, then my mother came in uh, uh, to serve me food then also i was uh, talking to myself and she also did not figure it out she thought that i was uh, having a mental disorder so she uh, suggested me to go to a psychiatrist so but i uh, kept on talking to myself they did not understand what i was going through uh, i went to the psychiatrist uh, and then uh, they also did not understand my story so they uh, help uh, so they thought that they would hypnotize me and ask me what i was going through uh my hip in my hypnotics when uh, when they hypnotized me then they concluded uh, that i was uh, living in a simulation so that is uh, that was the way they uh, tracked uh, my story and uh, all the all my friends and relatives they thought uh, all the time that i was mental but no but uh, no one uh, was ready to believe that what i was uh, undergoing only my mother helped me out in this bad phase and uh, that's it wow Like the most impressive thing about your speech is it lasted for exactly one minute. Do you have a timer in your hands right now? Tell me. Tell me truthfully. <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> I was just out of work, so I stopped. But still, like that, this was a great story, and as it is, it's very good to have you here. Thank you so much for participating. Okay, thank you, sir. All right. Okay, so next up we have Sachin Singh. Sachin, do we have you? Sachin, hello. Oh, it's to Sachin. Hello. Any response? Come on, Sachin. We know you are here. Uh, could you please recheck your mic? Maybe your mic is off. What if we build a ladder to reach the moon? Uh, Sachin, we can hear you actually. What if we build a ladder to reach the moon? Sachin, can you hear me? Hello. I'm sorry. Uh, I guess since this is a time-bound event, we'll have to move on. I think there is some problem with Sachin's mic. I could hear him for a while, but his voice was really, uh, really suppressed. So maybe his mic is not working properly. Uh, let's move on to the next contestant. So next up we have Amit Arvare. Amit, do we have you? I have a lot of content to write on you. Yes, sir. Hello, hi, Amit. How's it going? Hello. Hello. Hi. Now I can hear you. Amit, feel free to turn your camera if you want to, but there's no pressure. All right. So, are you ready for your question? Yes, sir. All right. So here it is. You got caught in a giant spider's web. The gargantuan spider is approaching you. What do you do? Hurry! Such in your time starts um, now. Oh, sorry, Amit. Right, Amit. Okay, sir. Please, yeah, please go. 
first uh, i'll read that spider very gently and i'll say um, that uh, i will um, uh, i'll treat him in such a way that uh, he he may get bluff but mm-hmm. when he does not get bluff mm-hmm. i'll try to bribe him by saying that if he uh, leave me i am going to bring him a uh, huge food such that by sitting in a one place only he can, he is able to live for 1000 years and uh, he may not do any hard work and uh, he may sit in a place and get huge and huge amount of food but when uh, he does not um, believe me in that too then i will tell him some sort of lies and i'll try to escape from the place but uh, finally but then also when he is not willing to uh, leave me i'll try to escape um, from the web and uh, i'll like to save my life sir oh wow well wow, that was a good story actually that was a really good story amit by the way do you know the origin of the word gargantuan or gargantuan like as some people pronounce it no sir so uh, have you like uh, seen that movie i am forgetting its name in which there's a big black hole like i'm I really messed up I, i don't remember its name so that black hole it was really big and it was named gargantua maybe you heard of it maybe some of our audience they know the name of the movie they can remind me later gargantuan means very big like so big that you cannot even comprehend with your human senses and do you know what you just did you just conned a gargantuan spider you told him a story and you 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 conned him into, him into leaving you and not eating you so that was really well spoken like very well done thank you sir right. okay so uh, next up we have we got amit and uh, okay so next up we have dr vikas kumar sharma do, do we have you dr vikas hello yes sir good evening good evening sir hello am hi, i audible hi hi yes sir hi, can you hear me yeah you you yes. yeah you are audible you, am i audible yeah. to you yeah yes sir it's very clear so can you please uh, share the topic okay what if we build a ladder to reach the moon okay if i yeah. bu- uh, ladder is built to reach the moon okay sir sir uh, like uh, i was in my dream one day and i saw a poor man and uh, he was uh, begging for some money i asked him don't beg ever in your life begging is uh, not less than a crime and uh, i will give you money i am ready to give you money if you make a ladder for me to reach to the moon and uh, he did the same thing he made a very beautiful uh, ladder for me to reach to the moon it was made up of a uh, silver that was shining a lot and that was matching to the color of the moon so i started uh, moving on the uh, ladder and to reach to reach to the moon when i reached to the moon again there was uh, a princess uh, she was wearing uh, a silver gown she was looking very pretty and uh, she welcomed me she hugged me she kissed me and uh, she made me to sit uh, on her uh, chair and that was also made up of silver so every everywhere on the moon there was a bright light that was very pleasing that was very cool also then princess asked me what's the reason for you to come on the moon i said princess i have come on the moon because uh, on earth there is spread of covid 19 and uh, i showed uh, her a picture made by me uh, for her because I, i i knew that princess will be there on the moon so i made a pic for her very beautiful painting then uh, seeing my painting she uh, she said it's a very beautiful I'm painting i'm sorry i'm sorry to interrupt art. you at this i'm sorry yes. to interrupt you at this point uh, yes, i have to because your one minute is up so but okay, i right. i like i right. can for sure say one thing Yes, out of sir. all the stories that you've heard that you've heard so far yours was like one of the most imaginative and the way you thank started you. with the human element and thank at you. the end you like related it to covid and everything yes very sir. well done man very well thank done thank you thank you very much sir thank all you right. sir all right it's wonderful having you thank you so uh, guys i'm i hope you're having like some fun so far i know i am and let's keep this going so next up we have neela Uh, Neela, am I saying that correctly? And before that, are you with us? Yeah, yeah, I'm here. Okay, so Neela, let's get you your topic. You dive into you the dive Pacific into uh-huh, and come out of the top of Mount Everest. What the hell is going on, Neela? Tell us what the hell is going on. What is this? Give one minute. Go. Ooh. Okay, that's fascinating. and uh, and now i am in the top of the mount everest i think it's a great thing so i will take a selfie and uh, share with the twitter and say 
Yahoo, and now I'm in Mount Everest, and I'm so happy to be here, and that's all. This is the story I have, and maybe I Dino, got some uh, Dino. appreciation. Mm -hmm. Okay, please go on. Um, and that's all. Thank you. Okay. Do you know what I like the most about your story? Hello? Neela, are you still here? I, yeah, I think, yeah. yeah, so the thing I liked the most about your story was that you took a selfie and then you posted it on Twitter. What the hell, Neela? Is that where you post selfies? Twitter. I um, think you went to say Instagram, but that was a very quirky thing to say. Your story was short, but it was quirky. I liked it. Uh, thank you so much for participating. Okay. okay, I'm so glad. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Next time, post your selfies on Insta, not on Twitter. Please, I request you. Okay, next up we have Kanika. Kanika, are you here with us? Hello. Hello, yes. hello. Am I audible? Oh, first of all, I'm so sorry. I yeah, you're audible and I think I pronounced your name incorrectly. It's not Kanika, it's Kareka. My bad. Yeah. Yeah, yeah Kareka. So, are you ready for this? Uh, yeah, sure. All right. I think you've got one of the good ones. Scientists at CERN laboratory get carried away. Their experiments create a black hole inside a lab. Oh my God. Oh, inside Go. the lab? Yeah, no, out, inside the lab, outside, it doesn't matter. Their experiments create a black hole. Now it's okay. your turn to speak on this. Okay. So uh, one day while I was sleeping, I had a dream in which uh, my mother who works on, my mother who works on CERN uh, said to me that they were experimenting on a certain object they found from the, they which fell from the space. So I was aroused as someone who wanted to be an astronaut. I was really aroused and excited about what it was. So while I was uh, with her, uh, while I was accompanying her regarding the experiments, I found out that there was a mad scientist who was really interested in that and was going at it. Like uh, he didn't have a care in the world about what is happening, what, uh, what other scientists are saying. He was just taking the object and just doing everything he can. So while, uh, so after, some time there was a sudden explosion and there was a small hole which sucked everything in it from uh, the experimental lab from experimental test tubes everything i got really scared and i, I was shouting my mother and all the things of uh, my life flashed back in front of my eyes i was scared i was astonished i was surprised i was anxious everything but uh, then afterwards i felt a sudden pain I felt a sudden pain and when I woke up, my mother was slapping me hard to wake up. So to wake up. <laughs> Thank you. That, that was totally on point. That was a really good story, Karika. And I guess if a black hole opened up near somewhere near me, that would pretty much be my reaction. I would first lose my wit about it and that, then my mom is going to wake up, wake me up with a tight slap. That is pretty much what's going to happen. A very good response. I Thank really you. appreciate you taking part. I'm sorry if I was a bit fast because I was no. really uh, anxious and nervous regarding No, this. no, no. Actually, that was a good thing because your speech, it lasted for exactly like one minute and two seconds. So you were like one of our most on-point contestants. All Thank right. you. Thank you very much. Okay. So next up we have Aditi. Aditi, are you here with us? And yes, uh, what has happened to my... Okay, uh, so I'm seeing Sachin's screen. Sachin, can you please stop uh, presenting? I'm not sure what's going on here. Hello. Let me check, guys. Uh, all right, I guess we are back to normal. Let me just put on the topics back. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, uh, Abhinav. Abhinav, sorry, I was just like, by yeah, no, that is that is completely okay. Sorry. You turned on your turned off your screen share, but right now I cannot figure out how to turn on mine. Okay, okay, I figured it out. Oh, thank God. Okay, I'm extremely so, sorry for that. Sachin, like uh, you're not in our roster here. I'm not sure. Like, uh, according to the list that I have, next it's Aditi's turn to speak. Yes, sir. Yeah, yes, sir. I'm here. Yeah. Aditi, uh, thank you so much for being here. Uh, for a second there, I thought we'd lost you. Okay, Aditi. So I'm just going to give you your topic and let's do this. All right. 
Aditi, you just discovered that your maths teacher, Mrs. Kulkarni, is an AI. First of yeah. all, Aditi, do you have a math teacher who is named Mrs. Kulkarni? Tell us honestly. I had when I was in tenth class, I guess. Was she an AI? Uh, pardon? Was she an AI? AI, by the no. way, means artificial intelligence. You can. Like, yeah, yeah, sir. A robot, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's it. So was she a robot? No, no. She was very straight yeah. and all. Um, so very yeah. like a human only. Well, technically, you can say that she was a robot, right? I and mean, she was so strict with everybody and the way she took <laughs> yeah. the classes. All right, like let's not waste that much of time. Uh, so just go ahead. Your time starts now. Ah, uh, so yeah. So first of all, I'll be very excited to know that my math teacher is a is an AI. Ah, uh, first of all, I will click a selfie with her and post on Insta. Then I will ask her about the things that she. can do that will make me uh, realize that yes she is an ai not a human first of all she will not need clothes to hide her body so i would ask her to show her real face um i will ask her to show her her real face uh, i would ask her to do many such things like only that only ai can do i will ask her many questions uh, and she should be able to answer all of them no i'm not just all not just only of maths but anything i may ask she should know that um after that i'll also uh, yes uh, that's okay that was really good actually first of all i was really glad that you posted your selfie on instagram not on twitter and yeah. then secondly that was a pretty slick to ask her all the questions because obviously an artificially intelligent robot would know the answer to everything Pretty smart move, I must say. Yeah, yeah. So I guess right. I spoke less, but mm. but no. No, no. That is that is completely okay. Like we can speak for ten seconds; it doesn't matter. You have to be witty. You have to be creative. That's it. All right. So up next we have uh, Piyush. Piyush, are you here? Hello. You sham sorry you have like ten seconds to acknowledge otherwise we'll have to move on I'm afraid because we are short in time. Okay, I guess we should move on. Next up, uh, and like if we see if we are able to uh, cover all the other contestants, we will come back to you. All right. So next up we Hello. have. Hello. Uh, who's this? Hello. Hello. Piyush hi hi piyush i'm glad okay piyush i'm glad that we uh, found you in time hi good evening where are you roaming yes. looks like i am moving from here yeah okay piyush so uh, let's give you your topic yes sir <laughs> who wrote this stuff oh my god this is really good Okay. You should eat a watermelon seed by mistake. Now the doctor tells you that there is a watermelon tree growing inside your stomach. I am. Uh, yeah. Uh huh. Yes. Yeah, you've got sixty because, seconds. Your time starts now. Because Martin. water is life. Uh mm huh. -hmm. Yes. Water is life. Water is important for for your human life. Uh, because uh, uh, human are cutting down the trees and therefore uh, pollution is increased in our day to day life uh, so uh, we save the all plants trees and environment and uh, environment save and thank you for this opportunity thank you very much sure, and thank you for wish. inviting to you thank you Sure. Thank you Thank so you. much, Piyush. Uh, you spoke well, but it was a little bit off topic, and you. Uh, I guess let's see what happens. Okay, I'm going to introduce the next can next player. Uh, up next, we have Shatej. Shatej, do we have you? Hey Manu, uh, may I interrupt you here? Yeah. Hey Manu, may I interrupt you here? Okay. Uh, I mean, uh, I'm Sachin here, and uh, I guess okay. uh, I have participated. Sachin, so, uh, at that like we tried calling out your name for 
uh like around a minute but at that point there was no response i think there was a problem with your mic or anything or something so once we are done with uh, like the other contestants we are going to get back to you so i'm sorry for doing this uh sure sure but, but i like sure, i just i, I thought i just missed it yeah so no, that is so that, good, is, that is that is coming with you all right sure 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 thank you so much Fine. okay uh, so yeah Next up, it's like Shatish turn to speak. Shatish, do we have you? Uh, yes. Uh, oh, good evening. Right. Good evening, Shatish. So Thank my topic you. is. Uh, yeah. So, yeah. Earth has turned from sphere into cube mm -hmm. overnight. Mm -hmm. Scientists are going crazy on it. So when I uh, this happened, I was sleeping at my bedroom, and uh, when I woke up, there was this news that Earth has turned into cube. then the, these scientists were trying to figure out how did this did happen then we figured out that there there was the death star from star wars just above our horizon and they were trying to uh, destroy our planet so this happened and the whole world was going crazy and the timelines were uh, demolished uh, the uh, flat earthers were like this, this happened we knew this would happen and all and every uh, atheists were like this would happen we did, we knew that they were no gods and all and there were aliens and every uh, like there were chaos everywhere and things like this and scientists were like the this would happen and gravitational force will be like this and that then so yeah yeah so that's your time is like precisely up it was for exact one minute that you spoke and i must say you painted quite a picture there that was really a really good answer thank you thank so you. much shitesh for participating uh next up we have abhishek gupta abhishek are you here with us yeah yeah <laughs> hi i really like that photo in background that blue uh, uh, planet yeah, of earth Yeah, I am in space right now. You might not know this. Yeah, yeah, I is... knew you are looking like <laughs> intelligent uh, alien yeah, yeah, yeah. species. <laughs> Actually, we couldn't we couldn't have done this like a month before. Then yeah. after that, uh, that uh, Elon Musk he like sent out his first batch of Starlink website. So I'm using that internet connection to communicate with you guys here right now. I am literally in space. I don't Please know. Please convey my regards to Elon Musk. <laughs> yeah, I will. I will do that. He's on my speed dial. Okay, yeah. without wasting any time, you've yeah. got one minute. Your topic is you discover a secret tunnel under your home. Where does it lead? See, topic itself is very uh, sensational. <laughs> your one, your one minute is going, man. You've already already yeah, lost ten yeah, seconds. Uh, so let me see. Uh, 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 I was parking my car in the in the basement, and then I suddenly saw a hole, and when I dig it, then uh, I realized that it's not a simple uh, small hole; it's a huge tunnel. and then uh, i started uh, following that tunnel and that tunnel led me to one uh, uh, to a huge uh, what should were underway and where uh, i i found there's a there was a huge amount of gold in uh, at the end of that tunnel and uh, i felt very happy because suddenly i become a billionaire because of that huge treasure and that's all Yeah, that's that's good. Now that you've become a billionaire, you should start your own series of satellites to provide we, internet we to those of us who are out here in space. We both should start, and yeah. uh, we should have, uh, uh, invite the uh, Elon Musk also to India. Definitely, we'll, he we'll should definitely come and invite start up. <laughs> we'll plan a <laughs> we'll plan a get together with him. Okay, thank you so yes, much yeah. for speaking. I'm sorry we have to move on. Yeah, thank you. All right. So after Shatesh, we have. Mm I guess Sachin are you still here with us? Yes I'm here you I'm here only. Yeah so since you've been waiting for so long I thought let's do this let's do this with I'm, you. Come I'm on. so glad like uh, you yeah, yeah. like thank you <laughs> thank you. I can me. I can see your raised hand even right now even at this moment so oh, sorry. I thought like let's Let do me put this. it down sorry. Yeah no no it's completely okay <laughs> yeah, no. but your one minute your one minute it starts now go. No, so uh, I'm really I'm uh, never about like the topic you have given the me. The topic is dinosaurs. Uh, I, that okay, I'll I'll tell you and reset your clock. Your topic is dinosaurs never went extinct. Go. So yeah, dinosaurs were like the only thing, like only the biggest vulture we have heard of 
in our history so yeah i believe like still there are dinosaur but yeah they are like uh, quite a small in size and that's what we have seen in so many movies like uh, dinosaur based movies were like uh, jurassic park and like in so many movies we have like seen that ki yeah people are like just crazy about the big uh, vultures and uh, they were firstly uh, captured dinosaurs and the big uh, vultures and same as well the time uh, i would say dragons yeah so yeah uh, it's a still mystery but yeah i have to say this like uh, as we have seen in that movie like uh, journey to the island yeah, yeah like that only some dinosaurs are still around us but yeah they are quite small in size so yeah you yeah, can still one, feel them that is your one minute very well spoken Uh, you seem like a big movie fan. Do you do you know the name of the movie that I was forgetting earlier, in which there's this black hole called called Gargantua? Uh, it was okay. No, uh, I'm not about that. Uh, like I'm not aware about that movie. But yeah, very I've seen so many movies about space like, movie. black hole. It was a very famous space space movie. They like actually hired Kip Thorne, the physicist, in order to like work out the equations and how the black hole would look. Oh yeah, I remember it. It was called Interstellar. Right. Oh yeah, interesting. Yeah, it was a really great movie. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I I can't it. believe yeah. I forgot its name. Oh okay, but we are getting off track here. <laughs> no. Thank you so much for participating. Uh, yeah. All right, Sachin. I guess. Thank you very uh, much, Abhinav. Like, thank you very much, uh, okay. and thanks to all of you, like uh, listening me patiently. Thank, thank you. Thank you so much. All right. So after Sachin, we have got Shashank. Shashank, are you here with us? Yeah, yes, yes, yes. Okay. Is this really your topic? Okay. All right. So, and I I want to say this topic out loud because I think it is one of the best topics that we have made for this event. You find, you a, find watch a watch that can open a portal into the parallel universe. Come on, man. Go. Your time starts now. Okay. Today I brought a very fascinating watch. I was playing with it the night, and suddenly I switched the button that that has been AI to it. They are actually says that you are you want to go to a parallel universe and find yourself there. I thought I should be in the other dock and that is easier. Yes, and suddenly I am I get confronted by a bright light up and lo, I am transferred to a transferred to a parallel universe where Earth is orbiting a giant black hole in the other end. And everything is there is off exactly opposite here, here on Earth. So I became curious and. Uh, I need to find my parallel self, my uh, host, how will be and so on. There I encounter uh, India is in uh, North East in Europe uh, and Arctic and Antarctic are desert with uh, polar bears with the uh, arms that so fat. And I I continue exploring all the exploring the planet uh, as the uh, filled with awe and uh, surprise. But suddenly, just before I could uh, see my parallel self. Uh, I get the warning the watch that my time is up. Shashank, uh, I'm sorry, I'll have to stop you here. Your time is up, uh, and there was a little bit of a problem with your mic. I, like I was able to make out what you said, but I hope our judge, our judge was able to do so as well, so that he can be scored fairly. But thank you so much uh, for taking out time and being with us. All right, uh, we you. have to move on to our next contestant. All right, after this we have Kanak. Yes sir. Hello Kanak. Yeah, yeah, I am there. All right Kanak. So, yeah. <laughs> This is a good yeah. one. This is a really good one. Kanak your time starts now. Go. Uh, yeah, what if, if Einstein, Einstein and Newton have... were your roommates? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, if they were my roommates there would have been probably two cases. One that if I was too dumb then I would think that what are they doing there all whole time in the books they are just exploring and doing researches they don't want to enjoy or sleep and they are in all these things only and the second case would have been if i were also much intelligent like them then i would have pers- uh, probably i would have done much researches like them or maybe i have discovered the laws of motion before newton that why did the apple fall from the tree or uh, 
maybe exploring uh, space uh, activities like Einstein, the theory of relativity and all means uh, that would have been much enthusiastic and surprising for me. I would have also got much name and fame from all these resources. It would have been literally very interesting. Thank you. I am so glad this question came to you. I'm so Goodbye. glad that your question, this question, because because I guess you made perfect use of Einstein and Newton as your roommates. A, you took like proper advantage of them, and I guess like nobody could have made better use out of these two people, these two geniuses that you did. And thank you so much, thank Kanak. Thank you so for, much. Yeah. Right, right. Okay. So uh, up next we have Aditya. Aditya, do we have you? Hello. Aditya, are you there with us? Yes. Hi, Aditya. How are Hello. you? Hello. I am fine. How do you like your question? I like it. I like, like it. robots. Ah, okay. So, okay. I'll repeat the question for the audience once and then you'll get your one minute to speak on it. Okay, so okay. the question is, I took up a new job and find out and found out that a robot is my boss. Okay. I will first join go. my I will first join my job. I will say hello to my boss while he speaks. Hello, you are you a new uh, worker? Uh, then I will reply, what robot is my boss? Then uh, he say, uh, another worker says, yes, robot is our boss. Then uh, rob, uh, boss gives us me a new job. You, uh, and he said, you should finish it in five minutes. So I will take five and one second, five minutes, one second to complete. So he said, you have delayed my, delayed the work. So you, uh, you should uh, do it in another 10 minutes. So I will submit it. Then I uh, after a few days I will ask a leave to for him. While asking, he will say no. You have worked very slow, so you should not uh, leave for it. Then the car uh, current will go. Then the robot will be off. Then we we I take leave and go. That was really good, man. Have you ever held a job before? I'm just curious. Like, are you a working professional? No, I'm only studying in school. <laughs> yeah, it was really awesome having you here, man. Thank you so much for participating. And I'm we all loved your answer. Okay, okay. sir. All Thank right, you. Bye. bye, you're welcome. Bye. Okay, bye. so uh, we have a lot of contestants still lined up. But uh, before we move on any further, I recognize that some of you who were earlier here to just be the audience have now changed your mind. You want to take part in this, don't you? Because it is so much fun. I mean, I'm having fun and I'm pretty sure you're feeling, all of you are feeling the same way. So taking that into account, what I am going to do right now is I am going to open up the chat window for another 20 seconds. And if you are one of those who have changed their mind and now want to take part in this, it is your time to shine. What you have to do is you have to write a single message. In that message, there should be your name and your age. All right. So uh, we'll open the chat window. Be ready with your keyboards. Pay your attention uh, on the chat windows on your Zoom screen. And uh, let's do this. Let's take up some more contestants. Wow, oh, we've got a rush of candidates coming in. Okay, we'll close the chat window now. I think we've got a lot more entries. I'm not sure how many we'll be able to cover this evening, but we'll try to accommodate as many people as we can. All right, so without wasting any time, let's move on to our next contestant who is, uh, just give me a second, guys. Yeah, we have Yashi. Uh, Yashi, are you with us? Hi, Yashi. If you're here, please say something. 
Okay, I guess we've lost. Hello, Yashi. sir. Hello. 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 Is this Yashi? No, sir. Good evening, sir. My name is Prajal Pandey from Ghaziabad, sir. Hi. I, I I request you to wait your turn to speak. Um. Uh. So we are we're like we are uh we are calling the contestants out in an order. So I'd really appreciate if you could wait your turn, please. Thank you. Oh, okay. Yes, after sir. all right. After that, you have Yashika. Yashika, are you with us? Hello, Yashika. Yashika, anybody home? Hello. Okay, I think we've lost her too. Uh, if she comes back, so we'll call her on later. Let's move on to Kritika. Kritika, come on, come on. Third time is the charm. We cannot lose you too. Are you with us, Kritika? Okay. Uh, Gauri. Finally, finally, I think we have Gauri with us. I was like beginning to get worried for a moment there. You, I'm pretty sure you all of you could see it on my faces. Hi, Gauri. How are you doing? Gauri, I'm so sorry, but I think there's some problem with your mic. Uh, I can read your lips, but I cannot hear you speak. Can you please double check? Gauri, I'm sorry. How uh, we still can't hear you. You're not on mute, that's for sure. But your voice is very low. Hello. Ah, uh, uh, that was the secret. Come on, Gauri. What were you doing? Like the mic was two kilometers away from your face. But still, now that you are here, I think we can start. <laughs> I'm so sorry to do this to you, Gauri. Can you please read out the question instead of me this time? Right. I am a monster with electrodes going into my brain, and someone is okay. experimenting on me. Like when I asked you to read this, I had no evil intent. I promise. All right. So, your time starts now. I was reading a sci-fi book, and suddenly, uh, when there was this page, it said that, uh, so like I watched this video wherein, uh, someone, the the uh, participant in the video, uh, he was controlling someone's brain, and then suddenly, when I was reading the book, I had a sudden sensation to go watch a movie, so I turned on the movie, and then when I started watching the movie, I wanted to eat suddenly, so I then started eating, and then I realized that. uh this is not the usual way do i never uh, get back from uh, reading so i thought that something is this something different is happening and suddenly i looked at my hand it was all turning a new uh, hue it was a new color it was turning into and then suddenly a message flashed uh, okay so the uh, parallel universe is, has been opened and now uh, humans are going to be uh, controlled by this alien species that that was a really good response before we let you go i want to ask you one question what color was your hand after it changed colors i hope it was pink because i like that color <laughs> but then all of you would have to, like the entire you would have to turn into pink because like just a pink hand on a normal body would look quite weird i must say no, so sorry did it can also Body parts are of different color, so if my hand okay, is okay, okay. So, like, uh, the closest thing that I can think of is a packet of gems that I used to have when I was a kid. <laughs> I'm afraid we'll have to let you go, Gauri, now. But it was really wonderful interacting with you. Thank you so much. All right. After Gauri, we have Avni. Avni, are you here with us? Yes, sir. Okay, Avni. Uh, let me just quickly. So actually, it is Anvi. Come on! I keep doing this. Like this is the third time I'm mispronouncing somebody's name. Like by the end of this evening, I would be glad if I was calling me with my own name, Abhimanyu. I'm pretty sure I'd call myself Abhinav with the way things are going. All right, Anvi. So uh, this. Yeah, I wanted is... to ask a meaning. So okay, sir. Okay. So what is the meaning of implanted? So actually. 
I understand. Uh, implant, uh, implanted simply means that they perform a surgery on you and they put a chip inside your brain. And that chip, so chip is basically a simple, like small chip containing some electrical circuits or something. You don't need to be worried about that. Uh, you can interpret this question as they do an operation, a surgery on you, and after they are done, hundred percent of your brain's potential is unlocked. Like your brain now is capable of performing at one hundred percent. So that is the essence of the question. Uh, did that help? Yes. Okay. All right. So Anvi, your time starts now. Please. Yes. Sir. One day I was uh, I was riding a bike and suddenly a car, a, uh, I and the car was you know accidentally. Uh, it was an accident and. Uh, Uh, i got a surgery on my head and the surgeons accidentally uh, a a child entered the operation room and uh, he just tossed out a chip and that chip accidentally fell into my uh, head uh, when it was op- when it was being operated and uh, and when the surgery was over uh, i was busy in my uh, normal routine i suddenly uh, started solving a math problem that it, that i was uh, waiting for since one month i was trying to do that but i wasn't able to uh, i suddenly noticed that i'm actually able to do this uh, in just a second and i was so amazed that i tried to do the full book and uh, was able to do it this in one week that 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 was a really great story first of all and we and secondly i think like my take away from this would be that it is sometimes like mo- not just sometimes most of the times it is not as important to be prepared as people think obviously that has its merit but sometimes like we have to take a leap of faith and just get on that stage and start speaking and that is pretty much what you did right now and i'm thank uh, like i'm very thankful that you decided to take part especially in the second round All right. Thank you. Okay, guys. Uh, I guess we are a little bit short. A little bit short on time. So uh, I'll take just one more contestant. So we have Ria Chauhan with us. Ria, are you online? Yes, sir. Hi, Ria. Hello, sir. So Ria would be our last participant for the evening. Um, so sorry because we have run out of time and. we tried to cover as many contestants as possible uh, but all right riya this is your topic in the future world i fall in love with a robot oh wow that is a cool one okay. your time starts now so one day i was roaming in my garden i saw a box i wanted to open the box but it wasn't opening so i bought few tools to open it it was an opening with that then suddenly it opened i saw a time machine so i sat in it a uh, few buttons i uh, i clicked few buttons and then i came to future so i saw a few robots and there was a hands of robots so i just uh, i just talked to him i asked him his name i you know like then i asked him for coffee <laughs> he went so we went to a coffee shop we have had a uh, wonderful coffee you know it was tasty quite a bit then uh, he asked me that if you want to know that what was happening in this world and who am who was i i told him what happened with me that box and that tools and what happened buttons so he said oh then you are in future so i i was really shocked that i was in future i just ran out and you know i sat yeah. in the time well, <laughs> riya one all. request for, i have one request for you so this handsome robot that you just went out on a coffee date with Can you please find out uh, if she has if he has some female friends or something? Uh, some I'm too small friends. for a uh, lot, so <laughs> I just yes something. If, if, right, right. If he has some female robot friends, I would like pretty much love it if you could ask him to set me up on a date with one of them. All right, so that's just a humble request from my side. Okay. 
Okay, sir. Okay, thank you so much for participating. I guess that uh, is all of the contestants that we could uh, take today. So I hope all of you had a wonderful time. I know I did. Uh, I won't be forgetting this day for a long time. Before we wrap up, I would like to ask our esteemed judge, uh, Usha Ma'am, to come up here and like address you and speak a few words to the audience. Usha Ma'am, if you're here, over to you. Yeah, of course I'm here. Thank you, Abhinav. I hope I got your name right. <laughs> and uh, I really enjoyed, I really liked the inventiveness of certain, uh, some of the contestants. And um, it was quite interesting uh, because it's not easy to talk just for a minute when you don't even have any prep time. So what I admired was some of them were very quick-witted and came up with a convincing, had a scientific element in it. And that was one consideration as a judge, I had to judge. So I think it was a great, uh, just a minute, jam session on science storytelling. Thank you so much, ma'am. Coming from you, that phrase means a lot <laughs> because we all know how good of a storyteller you are. So, like, personally, I like writing stories. Like, this is this is actually true. I, 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 like, love writing stories in my own time. And, like, to talk to somebody like you, it was a real inspiration for me. And I guess for the entire team as well. Plus those who are present in the audience as well. Thank you so much, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you so much. All right. So, to all those of you who are still here with us, uh, I'd like to thank you for coming here. I'd like to thank you for like gathering up the courage and just taking that leap of faith coming here live and speaking to us. All right. I hope all of you had a wonderful time just like me. And above all, I hope that you would stay tuned for our next event, which is Pictionary. So that is also a very cool game. Uh, this is not the first session that we are having on it. We had one last week as well. And everybody who participated, like the feedback, the comments, they were raving. So I request all of you to stay here and take part in that game as well. And after that wrap up, wraps up, we have another talk uh, by another esteemed, another eminent personality. So thank you so much for being here, guys. Uh, it was wonderful being your moderator and your jam master this evening. Uh, with this, I would like to transfer this call over to my colleague. Thank you so much. Hi, everyone. Um, hope you all enjoyed the jam session. Uh, this is Siddharth uh, on behalf of India Science Fest. Give us a moment. We are just um, creating the private room for Pictionary. Uh, I'll be back with the link soon.
So guys, we'll just let you know about the jam session results in a couple of days. Uh, so we'll be evaluating uh, all the responses with our judges and just, we'll just let you know in a couple of days. Meanwhile, Siddharth will uh, get back to you on how the Pictionary event will be going on. Stay tuned. So we had over 50 participants uh, joining us for the preliminaries last uh, week. And um, uh, out of those uh, 50 odd participants, we have selected the top scorers from across different rounds uh, who will be competing today in this finals. Um, we have upped the game uh, by including some difficult words. They are all related to science. Um, this is going to be screened uh, on this platform. Uh, while the 16 finalists will be competing against each other for the top spot. So just to give you a brief about this uh, game for those who are joining us for the first time today, uh, each participant will see three words on their screen. Uh, they are expected to pick one of them and draw while the rest of them uh, have to guess. Every participant gets a score both for drawing as well as guessing. And over, uh, over the entire period of the game, where uh, after all the rounds are over, the person with the maximum score is the winner. Uh, the participants have been requested not to use any alphabets while they draw. Uh, any such uh, act will result in disqualification. And we have shared the link with the finalists separately. Uh, we request the finalists to join uh, I'll quickly repeat the rules again. You need to register using your mobile number, the 10 digit mobile number that you have already used for your ISF registration. Once you have registered, you have to click on ready to indicate that you're ready to start the game. So I my colleague and uh, our host for today, Sagar, has shared his screen. Uh, you can see that uh, this is how your screen should appear once you have registered on the link with your phone number. Sagar will click on ready once we have all the 16 participants here. So we have a finalist joining here. As you can see, uh, seven of them have already joined. Um, in, in a couple of minutes, we hope uh, all the 16 participants to be online and then we can start the game. 
for those who are here in the audience um, you will also be able to guess uh, the different uh, words that are uh, shown here i hope you got you you all have uh, good fun there are a couple of people who are left we'll wait for last 30 seconds if we if they don't join we will start the session okay we are ready now uh, sagar request you to start the game those who are participating you need to focus on your own system uh, because you need to respond using the link uh, you need not participate on this webinar um, in order to score you need to be active on that particular link on which you have registered while the res rest of you can use the chat that is there on the webinar to make your guesses good luck everyone it was so apt that the first word was virus given the pandemic uh, we all uh, have uh, realized the uh, the kind of impact that a small virus can have on our lives um, so it was interesting that the first word was virus and many people were referring to corona on the chat
for all those who have asked for the link on the chat i just wanted to clarify that this is the finals of uh, pictionary uh, we conducted the prelims last week and that was um, published on the website as well only those who participated in the prelims and have been shortlisted for the finals uh, are participating today so we had total of 16 finalists and they are the ones who are currently participating
it's quite a close competition on the top several people with very close scores between 150 and 170 and it will just take uh, it's just a matter of a couple of pictures the scores can flip so don't lose heart keep guessing
all people in the audience can still guess on chat so there will be special prizes for them so we'll take note of all those who are guessing the right words so you can use the chat option to guess the drawing so there will be surprise prizes for all those with maximum number of guesses so please be active on chat please be active on chat that was round 1 for you uh, all 16 participants have played the first round uh, and we have the standing here um we have two more rounds like this so those who are slightly below don't worry you can easily catch up some of you are doing a really great job with the drawings um really impressive keep going
that's a nice way of using scientific symbols to depict something. Um, it's an easy one. I guess we see many of you have already answered. Many people on the webinar chat have got this one correctly, and we still have a few participants to guess the right answer from the equation.
while the pictionary is still on um, for our audience i would like to announce that uh, the model ma making competition is also under progress um, that's not a live event uh, you can check the details of this competition on our website uh, the finals will be next week those who are interested in participating are requested to go to our website check the mo uh, model making competition and uh, you can take part in that in that competition Just to give you more details, um, the topics for model making include renewable energy, environment, rainwater harvesting or smart cities, uh, space, science experiments and robotics. So you have a wide variety of topics to choose from. Uh, you can make any innovative models. Um, you need to send us a uh, pic and a video of uh, the model uh, once it is ready uh, by the 26th. Um, those who are shortlisted based on their submissions will be participating in the finals where they will explain about the model to a, to a panel of judges. As you can see, Pictionary has gone into the final round. Uh, we have quite a few people above 600 uh, and a few in 500s. Uh, it's the last round. Uh, we will conclude Pictionary in the next 15 minutes.
as we are about to end this fictional competition, um, I would like to announce that at 7 p.m. we have a talk by Dr. Ritu Raman. It's about biorobots. Uh, Dr. Ritu will talk uh, about how biorobots help fight diseases and it's very relevant in today's world where we are going through this uh, pandemic. I hope you all will find that talk really interesting. Um, <clears throat> we have a last uh, couple of rounds uh, left and uh, the game is about to end. I would like to transfer uh, it Shruti to take it forward from here. Uh, within five minutes, we have the talk on biorobots by Dr. Ritu Raman. Shruti will briefly introduce Dr. Ritu and then hand over the stage to her. Um, we will announce the results of Pictionary uh, on the website as well as directly to you. Uh, over to you, Shruti. Thank you. Thanks so much. Looks like the Pictionary game is going on really well. We have a lot of enthusiasts in the chat box and um, we are very, very excited for the next session that's going to begin in a few minutes. And um, yeah, just let's wrap up with Pictionary and then we can begin.
the results for the Pictionary will be announced very soon on social media, on the website, and the winners will also be intimated by our uh, team. And uh, I'd just uh, like to tell you all that we are going to start with a very, very exciting talk today by Dr. Uh, Ritu Raman, who is going to be talking to us about bio-robots. And, um, you know, stick around till the very end of this talk, because then you get to ask some really exciting questions to Dr. Raman, and she'll be answering them for all of us. So um, I hope you all had a good time playing the Pictionary game. I, I saw parts of it myself and it looked really exciting. And um, I just want to tell you all that uh, this was just one of the many games that we have as part of our festival. We have a drawing competition, we have model making, uh, we had uh, today, today we hosted just a minute or a science jam that went off really well and was very exciting. So uh, make sure that you tune into our website and check out all the events that we have planned for everybody, because um, you know we have some really exciting events and we really want all of you to participate. And the best part about all of it is that uh, the events are free. So um, make sure you call your friends and family and participate in all our events. And at this point, I'd like to do a quick poll with our audience members, because we'd like to get to know a little more about uh, your background. So uh, if you could please launch a poll uh, on your, uh, that you can see on your screens. Okay, so the results on my screen uh, tell us that the maximum number of students um, in our uh, attendees are college students. And then we have a few school students, a few faculty members, uh, professionals working in tech, a few entrepreneurs, as well as a business uh, students studying business, and a few from other streams. So clearly, we have a very good mix of uh, uh, attendees here. And now it's time for my second uh, poll, and this will be the last one. If you could just answer this for me. Wonderful. So the results tell me that most of our audience members have read a little bit about this topic somewhere, but don't know much about it and are curious to know more. Some of our audience members have studied this topic and wish to pursue it further, while a very small percentage are already professionals working in this field. So again, like I said before, a very interesting mix of attendees with us here today, which only makes the uh, talk even more exciting and interesting. And I would, at this point, uh, like to welcome Dr. Raman uh, to our um, festival. If you could please switch on your video and audio. Hello, happy to be here. Good evening, Dr. Raman. Thank you so much for joining us. It's such a pleasure to have you with us here today. We're very, very excited uh, to hear about um, the topic that you have planned for us today. I'd just like to tell all our audience members that Dr. Raman is a postdoctoral fellow in the renowned Langer Lab at MIT. And she is a member of the MIT Technology Review 35 Innovators Under 35 Class of 19, 2019, and has also been featured under the Forbes 30 Under 30 Class of 2018, and is actively working um, in um, biohybrid design. And she is going to be talking to us about biorobots, something we're all very excited to hear about. I'd like to tell our attendees that we have a Twitter contest. So take a screenshot of what you see on your screen. Tell us what you like the most about the talk and tag us on Twitter and we'll make sure that the best tweets come to everybody's attention and win exciting prizes. Dr. Raman, over to you. We'll be taking questions towards the very end and I'll be relaying them to you. Thank you so much. That sounds great. And thank you for having me. And I'm looking forward to sharing my work and also hearing the questions that people have. 
Um, so I'm going to start by sharing my screen and um, can you see the screen? Yes. Okay, great. Awesome. Well, it's great to virtually meet everybody. Um, and today I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the work I've been doing over the past, I guess, 10 years at this point on what biological robots can teach us about fighting disease. Um, and as I mentioned, um, or as was mentioned in the introduction, I'm currently a postdoc at MIT. Um, and I've put my contact info here and at the end of the slide as well. So I know that I don't come up with questions right away. Sometimes it comes to me like three days later in the shower. So like if you're that kind of person, um, feel free to reach out on social media, um, DM me a question, I'll be happy to answer them. Um, all right, so just to kick off, I wanted to start with a little bit of a personal introduction because I think it's nice to know kind of the story behind the science and why somebody might be inspired to do this kind of work. Um, for me, that inspiration uh, comes from my personal history with my family as well as my childhood. Um, so I was actually born in India, I was born in Chennai, and I lived there on and off um, throughout the years in like elementary school, but I also spent a good part of my childhood in Kenya. Um, and then I moved to the US um, when I was around 10 years old and I've lived there ever since, moving around a lot here too. So I've lived, moved around to all these other places and the only kind of consistency in my life um, came from my family. So my mom, my dad, and my grandfather um, we're all engineers. Uh, my mom's chemical engineer, my dad's a mechanical engineer, and my granddad was a civil engineer. And kind of, they've been like a really strong inspiration to me because I was always seeing how they were using their training to ask questions about their environment, to identify problems in their environments. And they always seemed to have the tools required to build a solution to a problem that they were facing in their life. And so I think that sort of sense of agency that I saw in them was really inspiring to me and always, um, even I didn't always know that I wanted to be a scientist or an engineer, I knew that that was a path um, that could lead to some really interesting things in my life. Um, for example, one particular story that I will highlight um, is that when I was growing up in Kenya, um, we lived most of the time in Nairobi, which is a city, but we also spent a lot of our weekends at villages, at rural villages in Kenya, where my dad's company was helping put up communication towers that would connect the villages to the rest of the world. And this was, I think, a really, really powerful demonstration for me um, that showed that, you know, with this mechanical engineering degree and training, you could do something that was really impactful for a community and that would have lasting change and that you could share that knowledge with a lot of other people. Um, so, you know, these are the kinds of things that happened to me in my early life that convinced me um, to apply for a mechanical engineering program at Cornell University, where I did my undergrad. Um, and when I was there, I was like, I'm gonna be a mechanical engineer because I wanted to be an astronaut at that time, because who doesn't? Everyone wants to go to space, right? Or I think most people. <laughs> um, so I'm like, all right, I'm gonna be an astronaut. So I signed up for the mechanical and aerospace engineering degree program at Cornell. But for some reason, I couldn't figure out how to sign up for the intro to aerospace class. So I ended up in an intro to biomedical engineering class because a girl who lived next door to me in my dorm said that the professor who taught it had a really great British accent. I'm like, well, that sounds like a good enough reason to take a class as compared to anything else. So I take the class um, and it turns out that in addition to having a great accent and being just a very funny and engaging educator, he also just was able to convey the excitement of this field and talk about how engineers actually had a lot to contribute to medicine, both in understanding um, why diseases occur and also developing strategies to treat them when they do occur. Um, so that really opened up um, the possibilities for me of me being able to do something for uh, medicine. But I, I don't think I really saw my path into that field until my first job. Um, so my first job or internship um, unpaid, so like not a real job, but you know, it was something, it was experience, um, was at in a lab, a biology lab, where they were studying skeletal muscle. And they were specifically looking at the fact that people who exercise a lot, we know have really strong muscle and like really strong muscle tone, but people who drink a lot of alcohol, like abusively, um, can have their skeletal muscle degenerate. And so they're like, what if you do both of those things? What if you drink a lot and also work out a lot? Can those two things kind of cancel out um, and essentially help out your muscle, at least achieve some sort of baseline? And so they needed somebody to get you know, rats drunk and put them on a treadmill and watch them run. 
and look at how their muscle tone and their weight and their behavior was changing over an extended period of time. And that might sound a little bit ridiculous, but that's actually one of the strongest ways that we had at that time to test a hypothesis like that. So of course I was the poor soul that was stuck in a basement of the lab, um, putting these rats on treadmills and watching them run. And it was kind of depressing um, like for just to sit there for hours and watch this. Um, but over time, um, I guess I had a lot of time to think and meditate about what was happening. And I realized that what was really interesting about these rats and about the muscle that was powering their running is that it was dynamically changing in response to its environment, right? And like, we were working with all these actuators in our classes in my mechanical engineering classes, you know, motors and shape memory alloys and whatever it is. And all of those things were working great, but they weren't responding to their environment in any way. So there was something really special about muscle and that stood out to me. And it kind of brought on this broader philosophical question of, you know, for thousands of years, engineers have been building with things like wood and metal and plastics, but that doesn't really help us in the same way that our bodies help us. Those materials, I could pick up my phone right now and I could smash it against the ground, right? And I could crack the screen and then what happens? Like I'm gonna have to go get it replaced or I might need to even buy a new phone. There's nothing that that screen can do. But if I fall off my chair right now, which happens a lot, it's kind of a wobbly chair, um, and I scrape my chin, uh, skin or I break my bones, my body is able to react to that in some way and help me achieve the function of my skin and bones that I had before, at least some approximation of that. So there's something clearly interesting and unique about biological materials where they're able to dynamically sense and respond to their environmental signals in ways that the traditional materials we build with don't do. And that really raises the question of what can we build with biological materials? And if we built, say, machines made out of these, would they be able to self-assemble or self-heal um, in ways that our bodies and other biological systems can do? Um, of course, now to be able to do that, you actually need a tool. You, you can just say, I want to build with biology, but... Uh, or biological materials, but like, how are you actually going to do that? Um, and for me, that answer came in the form of 3D printing. There are a range of tools that you can deploy and a range of different types of 3D printers that you can deploy. But I focused on a specific kind of 3D printing called stereolithography, where you use light to turn a liquid resin that is photosensitive into a solid. Um, and so we would pattern, I showed that you could pattern cells and biomaterials and proteins in these complex 3D structures to create through uh, different types of shapes, essentially, with living cells embedded inside. Um, so the obvious application of these kinds of technologies is in what we call reverse engineering, or creating tissues or organs like the heart that's shown um, on the left of the screen here that look exactly like tissues or organs inside our body. The idea being that you know, if we were able to do this at scale and in a way that really replicated the structure in our bodies, then if you got sick, if you had a heart attack, if you lost an arm um, in a in an accident, then maybe one day we would be able to replace it with these 3D printed replacements. And now we're obviously very far from that, but a lot of people are working on the beginning aspects of that problem in this reverse engineering space. But because I was a mechanical engineer, um, and really just interested in design and machinery, I was like, well, that's really great, um, but what can we do with biological materials that doesn't mimic what already exists in nature? Can we build machines or robots, for example, that forward engineer or have use biological materials in new ways to do things that aren't don't already exist in nature? And so that concept of forward engineering became um, very interesting to me and ended up what I uh, focused my PhD on at the University of Illinois. Um, all right. So I ended up at the University of Illinois as a mechanical engineering PhD student, and I ended up pursuing research at a center with the National Science Foundation between Illinois, MIT, and Georgia Tech, as well as a range of other partner institutions. And this whole center was focused on this idea of biological machinery, because you know, obviously I'm not the first person that thought of that or the only person that thought of that. Um, and, you know, as a whole goal, our center was to say, can we make machines powered by biological robots uh, or powered by biological materials and specifically robots as a class of machines. So just for the sake of having a definition that we're all on board with and all working with, I define a robot. I think a lot of people define a robot as a device that somewhat autonomously senses, processes, and responds to signals in its environment in real time, whatever that real time can be. 
And a biological robot or biobot or biorobot is a robot that uses biological materials to perform one or all of those functions, either sensing or processing or response or all three. And the goal of building these kinds of robots would be the same thing as you know the advantages that biological materials have over synthetic materials. So we can say, if I made a robot that it had biological components, would it be able to do some of these adaptive functional behaviors like self-healing that we can't currently see in robots that we currently have with synthetic materials? And so as a goal, um, for, as a center, we were like, can we make you know a robot that senses some toxin, moves towards it and neutralizes that toxin? And that's a huge, huge fundamental technical problem and so we all decided to kind of break that up into pieces and focus on specific aspects. And I was charged with the problem of like, can you get the robot to move and walk around? So specifically focused on actuation. Um, so when I started my PhD, in 2012, there were actually a couple great examples of people that had already made robots that moved and walked around powered by biological materials. And I'm showing you videos of both here that I hope you can see. On the left is a swimming jellyfish like robot and on the right is a walking sort of inchworm like robot. And both of them kind of operate on the same principle, which is that they're made of a flexible polymer on top of which has been seated a layer of cardiac muscle cells. And when all the cardiac muscle cells beat, the polymer deforms and so you're able to create these kinds of motions. Um, so they focus on motion because it's a really intuitive demonstration of functionality, but also pretty much every machine needs to generate force and produce motion. So it's something that's really important and broadly applicable. And they pick cardiac cells or muscle cells from the heart because these cells produce a lot of force. Obviously, they're pumping blood throughout our bodies. Um, they don't need you to tell them to turn on or off. They're just beating all the time. Also makes sense. Your heart never turns off. And if it does, you're in trouble, right? Um, and they also all beat at the same time, which also makes sense. So all these cells are electrically connected to each other. So they beat at the same time so that our heart is functioning as a pump. If they were beating at different times, you would have an arrhythmia and you might have, um, again, might end up with problems. So it makes sense that they use cardiac muscle, but there are some limitations um, of this. And part of it is that lack of on-off control. Um, those of you who are engineers or aspiring engineers might realize that having a machine that never turns off is not necessarily something that's super advantageous. Um, and also heart muscle cells have limited regenerative capacity. They can't necessarily heal after damage. This is why things like heart attacks end up being such big problems. So you want something ideally that is robustly resilient to damage and that led me to think about um, skeletal muscle because that really kind of addresses a lot of the problems we have. So skeletal muscle in our bodies is what po powers all of our voluntary motions, right? Like moving, dancing, running, all of those things. It can heal after small damages. It can be turned on or off through electrical signaling, usually from motor neurons in our peripheral nervous system. And it's also just a really good actuator in the sense that if you compare the force per unit volume, um, it does much better than most synthetic actuators that we have to date. And so it has this really nice hierarchical structure where at the micro scale, there are these two protein filaments, actin and myosin, that are sliding against each other. Um, but at the macro scale, when this happens several times in series, you can see these really large contractions. So as an actuator, you can see why it might be a very appealing tissue of choice for people to use. Um, but how do you actually go from saying like, okay, I understand that muscle produces force to here is a robot um, that is powered by muscle. And I think that's where kind of taking inspiration from biology um, really comes to mind. So in our bodies, skeletal muscle is tethered to our bones by a relatively stiff tendons and then stretched across an articulating joint such that when the muscle contracts, you can generate these sort of large locomotions or actuation behaviors. So you can recreate that in the lab by first looking at that sort of skeletal structure and saying, how can I do um, something that looks like that? So we used a 3D printer to print a low stiffness beam that mimicked that articulating joint at the ends of which we put these high stiffness pillars that mimic the tendon. And then we said, if we tether the muscle to these two um, tendons, we should be able to generate something that can contract and deform the overall structure. And to actually create that muscle, we took some living um, cells, uh, mouse skeletal muscle cells, mixed them with a whole bunch of proteins. And so it kind of looks like this jelly or goop-like um, solution. We injection molded around this uh, skeleton. And over time, because they're living, um, the cells self-assemble. So they proliferate, they exist, they exert forces on their environment, 
they're compacting that tissue around themselves and they fuse together to form these long fibers that are these green lines shown in this picture here. And that is the basic contractile unit of skeletal muscles. So once it gets to those long uh, fibers with multiple cells fused together, you know that it should be able to start generating force and producing motion. Um, so already you start seeing that even without contraction or anything, um, the muscle is generating force. It generates a passive tension force that is counteracted by the skeleton that you've printed the muscle around. And you start seeing that it starts responding to its environment, which is really interesting because with any kind of synthetic material or actuator, you know, you say produce this much force, it produces that much force. That's all it does. It doesn't respond to its environment in any way. It can't change its behavior after you've already put it inside the machine. But muscle can. If you print it, um, if you pattern it around a stiffer skeleton, it can generate larger forces because it's getting more aligned. It's producing different kinds of proteins. It's maturing at a higher rate. If you put different growth factors into the media, that's the solution that the muscle is sitting in that's feeding it. Um, you see that it can dramatically increase force production as well. And so already you start seeing that building with this biological material has started making a difference. The robot is responding to its environment in a way that a traditional robot would do. Um, but of course, that's interesting. But what you're actually interested in is measuring muscle contraction, right? So the way we do that is, as I mentioned before, in the body, the muscle is getting signals from neurons that are telling it to contract. And we don't have that in this system. Um, but one thing that we can do is place it between two electrodes and send electrical pulses through the tissue such that we can elicit a contraction. So if you send a pulse at like one cycle per second or one hertz, you get one contraction. If you do it at four cycles per second, and you get four contractions. One thing that you do see is that it does change a little bit over time in that if you're um, doing one hertz contraction, the muscle can contract and then relax completely before you tell it to contract again. But as you get to these higher frequency contractions, the muscle can't fully relax before it can contract again. So you can start seeing that the dynamic range of the force that's being produced gets smaller. And this is actually something that's very similar to what happens in natural muscle. So we know the muscle is behaving as it should. The next thing that we did is looked at, you know, can we get these robots to actually walk? It's cool that they're producing force, but can we get them to actually do something? So the way we did this um, is by first doing some little computational modeling to say, oh, like if a symmetric structure exists and we contract symmetrically, we're going to get something that looks like dancing, but it's not really going to do much, right? Um, however, if you make the sl structure slightly asymmetric, where one leg is a little bit longer than the other, you can get the robot to slowly walk in the direction of the longer leg. Um, so that was our prediction. And actually what we ended up seeing, as hopefully you can see in this video, the left leg is a little bit longer. And so with every muscle contraction, the robot is slowly crawling in the direction of the left leg. And another thing that we saw that was very interesting is that for slightly higher frequency stimulations, we started seeing slightly higher frequency um, or slightly higher speeds of walking, which makes sense as well. Um, so we can make the robots walk, which was great. It was actually the first demonstration of robots powered by engineered skeletal muscle that could walk. Um, and it's always exciting to be the first one to do something, right? Um, but also when you're working on something, you see the flaws more than anybody else. So one flaw that I saw was that one, these robots can only walk, and two, they can only walk in one direction. What use is that? Um, so the way that I fixed it uh, is by one, genetically engineering the cells so that they would be responsive to blue light. And so that means every time we flash blue light on them, they would contract, which means that you can focus the blue light at different parts of the tissue, right? So you don't have to activate all of the muscle at the same time as with electrical stimulation. And I thought maybe this is a way we can get it to do more interesting behaviors. Um, and the second thing we did is we converted to a more modular design. So rather than patterning the cells directly around the muscle, itself, we patterned it into a ring or rubber band like structure, which we could then pick up and transfer to any of a wide variety of skeletons. So there's this video here of me picking it up and transferring it to one of our sort of walking design skeletons that I showed you before. But other people have picked up these rubber rings and put them around a tube and tried to make a peristaltic pump, for example. So there's a lot of different types of designs and ideas that you can pursue by making this relatively simple modular change. I hope this video also kind of gives you a sense of the scale of these robots. Um, they're several millimeters long. We've made some that are in the centimeter scale, but those are my hands. So you can see that they're quite tiny. Um, 
All right, so then again, in these kinds of ring-like robots, we start seeing that the internal structure mimics um, natural muscle and also mimics its environment. It responds to its environment. So when we put these cells in the, the mixture itself, they're not in any particular order. They just sort of fuse together, right? But when they fuse together into these fibers, there's nothing technically that we are telling them beforehand, like you all have to align in the same direction and produce force in the same direction, but they can sense it. They can sense the mechanical environment of the skeleton um, that's pulling them in this direction. And so when they experience these tension forces in this central area, you can see that the myotubes are highly aligned along the axis of tension. And so when each of them contracts, they're actually all contracting in the same direction, which means that that's why we're seeing macroscale contraction in these systems. If they were all acting in different directions, you might not really see anything. So again, you start seeing that it's responding to its environment, but of course you want to actually see that you are able to elicit contraction from them in some way. So instead of using electrical stimuli this time, we used an optical stimulus because we had genetically engineered these cells, right? So they should be able to contract when they get a light signal. So we put an LED on top of them and just kind of flashlight, kind of like a disco ball um, and saw what happened. And we saw, in fact, that every time we flashed a pulse of light on them, the muscle would contract and deform the skeleton. And by knowing the mechanical properties of that skeleton and the size of it, we could back calculate the force that was actually being generated. Um, so we did that and again, repeated some of our experiments from before. Again, if you have a robot that has a leg that's a little bit longer on the right side, you can see that the robot is slowly crawling um, in the direction of the longer leg and that the speed of the robot can be regulated by increasing the frequency of contraction. But of course, this is just a repeat of what we did before and we wanna do something a little bit different, right? The whole point of using light is to say that you don't have to make the structure asymmetric, you just need to make the muscle contraction asymmetric. And so what we did was make these completely symmetric two-legged robots and showed that if we only excited one of the legs with light, or if we only excited half of the legs with light, we could do things like get them to walk in different directions or move and turn around. Um, so hopefully what you can see in these videos is that we have robots that walk in one direction preferentially because they are following the light. Um, and in the other case, in the right hand video, you can see that the robot is slowly rotating again because it's following the light. Only the muscle that is being excited by light is contracting. And so you can essentially get a robot to navigate 2D space. And we were able to do this fairly consistently across a lot of different robots. So we were confident um, this was something repeatable. Um, and the last thing I want to share with you about the space is, you know, I, I started with like, what can these robots teach us about disease? And I think that's kind of where the end of my PhD um, has really focused, um, partially because I was like, well, I made some robots that walk, but we already have robots that walk. I haven't proved that biological robots can do something that synthetic robots can't do. Right. And so I started this talk and my motivation for this research by talking about healing, how our skin can heal when our phone screens can't heal. And I decided to focus the end of my research um, during my PhD on that as well. And thinking about the fact that if I can show that these robots can heal, um, then I would really have proved that there is an advantage to building with biological materials. So the first thing we did is actually we had to go in and damage them. So we made the robots the same way as before. Um, we go in and we create a tear in the muscle and that tear um, over time propagates and the whole muscle rips apart and it's done like you can't do anything and the larger tears result in um, larger drops in the force that's being produced and the muscle cells are dead. And this is actually, this makes sense. This is exactly what should happen because those long fibers are something that we call terminally mitotic, which means that they can't differentiate anymore. Um, the way our body deals with this and heals that damage is that outside of the muscle, we have these small populations of stem cells or satellite cells that sit around the muscle. And when they sense damage, they move to the site of damage and proliferate, they create more cells and then they fuse together to form new fibers. So we realized that we would need to replicate that um, in our system. So that's what we did. We went in and first tested, like if I just heal this tear with some sort of biological glue, um, is that enough to recover force? And turns out it wasn't. Those cells were dead and then we weren't recovering them in any way. 
but in the glue, when we mixed in some new cells, some muscle stem cells that hadn't formed these long fibers yet, then we saw that the slowly, uh, we were able to recover force after seven days post damage. But you can see that the force that's being recovered is still less than the force that was being produced before damage, right? Um, but turns out that muscle can still do a lot of really interesting things. So we learned that if we exercise the muscle um, for 30 minutes with one hertz um, blue light stimulation every day, and also did local release of growth factors that promote muscle health and maturation, um, we could actually completely recover the force that was being produced by the muscle after two days post damage. Um, so you can see in this fluorescent image here, this red tissue is the original muscle. And the green tissue are the newly added cells that we um, included um, with the glue that we put in. So over time, you can see that the cells fuse together, they form these long fibers, they extend across the gap, they essentially bridge that gap, and they're able to generate force and produce motion at the same level as before. Um, and so this was, I think, the real showstopper for me because there have been no demonstrations of synthetic actuators or robots to date that you know, after they're broken can be revived in the same kind of way. If they're done, they're done and they have to be replaced. And so this was kind of the start of sort of what has become my line of research is saying, oh, look, like we can use, um, one, we've proven that biological robots can do things that synthetic robots can't do, but two, we can also use these robots as models of disease. We can look at how they respond to damage and we can develop new therapeutic strategies to combat that damage, which might be helpful if you lose, say, a large chunk of muscle um, in an accident or through something else. Maybe we can deploy those strategies in human beings um, that we learn in these robots. And so that's kind of what I'm working on right now. Um, one is using these robots to ask and answer questions about human disease, whether it's something like damage, like I showed you before, or whether it's say a genetic disease where your cells aren't able to produce as much of a specific protein and you have a muscular dystrophy that affects you through the rest of your life. We can use these kinds of robots as test platforms for new gene therapies or other types of medicines that could potentially, um, if they have you know, a curative impact on these robots, then we can study the mechanism of that and feel a little bit more comfortable um, choosing the therapies that we would want to eventually deploy in humans in clinical trials. Um, the next scientific step that I also wanna take is start thinking about the fact that like, at this point you can just turn the muscle on or off, but in our bodies, our muscles are much more complex than that. They are being told to turn on or off by motor neurons, which are actually getting a lot of feedback from sensory neurons that are sensing stretch um, in our muscle or might be sensing pain or heat from our skin. So there's, it's a very complex feedback control loop that's not accounted for in the system right now. And so integrating those neurons and that sort of neuronal control will allow us to have a better understanding um, of muscle in our bodies and also make robots that can navigate complex environments or serve um, their function with a greater degree of autonomy. They can do more than just on or off. They can respond to specific stimuli, process them, and make some sort of decision behavior. Um, so that's kind of the goal. And eventually, over the long term, I think that we would be able to you know, deploy these robots perhaps as functional implants inside humans. So you can imagine that if we were able to create this muscle at a much larger scale, we would be able to use that to replace muscle that had been lost um, in the body, or perhaps serve as a factory of chemical factors um, that could help communicate with tissues around their systems and help us restore any kind of disease or damage that we were suffering from. So I know I threw a lot of information at you and I'm happy to answer um, any questions that you have. I do wanna wrap up by saying um, that we are working on a lot of things where we um, are teaching students at um, high schools, undergrad classes, how to build their own biological robots. And if you're interested in learning more, um, again, you can contact me on social media, but I also have a um, book coming out on this topic and other things that we can build in biology in September. So with that, I'd just like to thank all of the professors and labs and funding sources that have um, supported this work throughout the years. And I will keep this slide up as I answer um, any questions that you have so you have access to my contact.
thank you so much dr raman that was very very insightful i think uh, bio robots this is a topic that we don't often hear about um, on an everyday basis i mean robotics uh, this is a topic that everybody has heard a lot about in the recent few years but bio robots in particular i think very very uh, fascinating uh, for me and i do think that the use of so many visuals uh, that you incorporated in your uh, presentation it was very helpful to relate the kind of research, relate with the research that you were doing so thank you so much for taking the efforts of you know putting everything together um we have received quite a few questions on zoom as well as on social media where we're live streaming our events so i'm just going to start asking you one question after the other so the first question that um i'd like to pose to you is are there any ethical issues that you are dealing with while building bio robots how are you dealing with this issue yeah that's a great question and i'm so glad that you asked um so i think that there are definitely ethical issues in the sense that one big question that we ask ourselves not only us but anyone working with biological materials is just because you're working with living cells are you working with something that is alive um and that's a very philosophical question right because you have to define what your definition of an alive thing is what an organism is does that involve something that has some degree of autonomy or consciousness and especially when we think about integrating neurons or nerves um you know there's one thing to be said for a nerve that can just sense a stimulus and respond to it in a certain way and there's something else to be said that if we created a network of nerves that could resemble something that looks like the central nervous system or our brain are we creating something that has a consciousness and can feel pain um so that's certainly something that we think about very proactively um in one way um you know my goal as a scientist is only to do things that are helpful to other people and i really don't want to ever talk down to somebody and be like you don't understand the science like what do you know um this is fine they're not alive like i can drop them on the floor and they're good um and so i would say that right now we're all in agreement um the scientific community and also sort of broader policy makers that we've engaged with are in agreement that these are not close to anything that can be resembled a living creature because they can't really autonomously metabolize their food in any way they can't reproduce they have no consciousness um however if we did get to a stage where 50 years from now or 60 years from now we were getting ever closer to creating something that looked more similar to a brain or was capable of decision making then i think you absolutely have to be asking those questions and i don't think you need to wait 50 years from now so one thing that we try to do is i host these um sort of bioethics discussions i should have put a link in here of um bioethics website that we have where we talk about different scenarios and we elicit feedback not only from other scientists but from the general public um philosophers i work with a philosopher fairly regularly actually um policy makers everybody to get your feedback on like when do you think when is the line um where most people think it's too far and then i just don't do that um and that's how i um approach this work and i think a lot of scientists approach this work as well Well, thank you that was very well summarized like you correctly i mean you very beautifully put it across in the way that medical ethics bioethics this is a topic that scientists need to keep in mind on an everyday basis as we uh, advance ahead in technology and uh, well, it's very nice to know that uh, you and your colleagues are hosting symposiums on this topic which you know many people need to hear about uh, we have linked your website as well as a couple of your uh, social media handles in the chat so i would encourage everybody to just take a look at the chat and make sure that you uh, check out uh, dr raman's work online okay so um, the next question that i have for you here is um, <clears throat> so is there uh, the work that happens inside our muscles uh, for example lactic acid production how are factors like these affecting the robots inside the body how would they respond yeah um so that's a really great question as well um and it's it's similar in the sense that um the robot the muscle 
um, is metabolizing things in the liquid media surrounding it. It's creating ATP. It's using sugar in the media. It's converting it to ATP. It's having, you know, metabolic byproducts. It's different in the sense that because it's sitting in a liquid bath of media, a lot of that is just kind of draining out of the system. And we change that media every day. So it's not necessarily something where we have to create an active metabolic or vascular system where that would, those waste products would be need to be um, removed. However, if we were ever to make a robot that we were deploying, um, say outside of the, the construct of like sitting in a biosafety hood in a lab, then absolutely we would need to think about how do we metabolize those byproducts and how do we create all of the surrounding support systems that keep us alive in our bodies um, in these sort of robots. And even if we were going to say not deploy them into the world, but implant them um, inside of our own muscles, we would need to think about how those chemical byproducts are affecting other tissues. And that's part of what I'm studying now. Um, I developed this tool while I was at MIT for sampling the fluid between cells and sort of really complex tissues like the brain or in neuromuscular junctions. And we're looking at in different scenarios, how does that interstitial fluid or the fluid between cells, how does it comp its composition change and how can we um, control that change? And I think this is one of those questions that we'll be asking and hopefully answering with that tool. You know, that brings me, uh, I mean, you've made my job very easier because that links very perfectly to the next question that we have. Uh, how do you see bio robots playing out in the next five years? So you say that, you know, we're right now in the, uh, we're in the research phase. When do you see it actually getting implemented into healthcare on a regular basis? Yeah. Um, so I think that's a great question. And also for people, aspiring scientists, I think it's really important to know that you can make a lot of um, important advances and it might still not get to humans for like 80 years. And that's the kind of sacrifice that you make when you're working at the sort of pioneering side of research. And so for me, I would say in the next five years, it is absolutely possible that we could use these muscles as models of disease and perhaps use them as a test platform to test therapies, which would then be deployed in animal trials, which would then be deployed in human clinical trials. Um, in 50 years, um, I can, I would definitely hope that this and other types of cell-based therapies would be um, regularly deployed in humans and could be used to fight disease and damage. And I hope that you don't get discouraged by that. I mean, one story that I like to share is that um, the person I work for, my advisor, Bob Langer, he's the co-founder of Moderna, which is one of the companies that has made a COVID vaccine. And research on that project in our lab um, started 40 years ago. And like, yes, it's helping billions of people to today and is an amazing scientific product, but it's something that took people a very long time um, to persevere and work towards. And so that's kind of what I look towards is what can I get out of the next five years? I definitely ask myself that question, but I also think about what am I building towards over the long term in terms of how we can fight disease and damage. And I would love to hope that I'm working towards something that is um, as impactful as other researchers in my lab have worked on. You know, that, that definitely makes a lot of sense. Research isn't a, a one-year or a two-year affair. It, it goes on for many, many years, and you need, really need the perseverance to, you know, stand through and uh, make sure that the research that you're putting in, ha have faith in the fact that this research will be useful for uh, humans, say, 40, 50 years from now. Yeah. Um, and there are a lot of wins along the way, I should say. Like, every experiment that works is still exciting and still meaningful and moves science forward. Definitely. Absolutely. So uh, the next question that we have here is, uh, how is the ro bio robot going to be powered? So is it going to be battery driven? Is it energy driven? Can we look at sustainable methods of energy to power it? How exactly will it uh, sustain in the body and so on? That's a perfect question. Um, and I think it's really important you know, I focus on health, but obviously a big challenge that we're um, facing in the world is not just in health, but also in energy and sustainable sources of energy. So I think that's a great question. And actually one of my driving motivations for building with biological materials is that very thing. You don't need a battery to power muscle because it is powered by sugar, right? Sugars and amino acids in its environment are its battery. Um, now you can make an argument that perhaps manufacturing sugar and amino acids at that scale might prove um, to not be as carbon neutral as we think it is, um, but it is possible. And so these are the kinds of questions we have to ask also, like what are the energy costs of using that sugar and amino acid to power the muscle? And even if they're high, is the fact that they're biodegradable um, 
something that we should look at as a positive? So definitely a great question. Um, so I would say that our batteries are going to be these sorts of biological materials. However, I should say that energy and control are not the same thing. So if I were to continue using light um, or LEDs to control when it turned on and off, that would need something that looked more like a traditional battery, right? Um, and so that's why when we think about, can we integrate neurons? That's an additional component of this as well, because then you move away from that external um, battery driven control towards something that is also powered by other biological materials. Absolutely, that was um, really insightful. I think uh, the next question that we have here is, so what are the precautionary measures that you have taken into account while working on biorobots in your lab? Um, yeah, so we work with biological robots in very controlled environments. Um, so because they're made out of cells that are derived from mice, um, so from mammals, uh, they're actually very finicky about when they're going to work, which is they need to be kept at 37 degrees C at a specific humidity with specific oxygen and carbon dioxide. They can't get infected by bacteria or viruses or like you can't drop them on the ground. Like they're gonna die. Pretty much most of the time they're gonna die. Um, so actually keeping them alive um, is the bigger concern. So we keep them, for the most part, we store them in these incubators that keep them at the right temperature, um, pH, um, humidity, air levels, and then when we actually need to do stuff with them, like when you saw my hands messing with them in the lab, that actually happens inside something that's called a biosafety hood, which is um, has sterile laminar airflow inside it. And so I have my gloved hands that are completely sprayed down with ethanol, move, using them inside there, taking videos, doing whatever I need to do, and then I move them back to the incubator. Now, if I took them out of that controlled environment for even, you know, like an hour, um, they would die because the temperature is wrong or they get too acidic or they get bacteria. And we need to, we try to put like penicillin, penicillin and streptomycin, well, wow, it's hard to say, um, in the media to prevent that from happening, but it does happen. And so when we, again, when we think about in the lab, that's totally fine. And we're not necessarily concerned about it being able to escape that environment or do anything that we're not um, worried about. However, when you deploy it in another context, say inside the body, we don't necessarily have to worry about it dying because it should technically be at the right temperature and have all the biochemicals needed to survive. But you might wanna start thinking about are there off target effects? And again, this is why it takes 50 years, 100 years to do these kinds of work because you need to take very baby steps to say like, can, if I just put the cell in an animal and then eventually a human for one day or one month, um, what happens? And if nothing happens, then we can start building that out a little bit further, but we purposely take very cautious steps um, to ensure that nothing bad does happen. Oh yeah, absolutely. Because uh, this kind of research, I mean, research, mostly involves working in very controlled environments which need multiple levels of uh, uh, care that goes into you know the research but um, yeah that that was very very interesting um, the next question that we have for you is um, can these uh, muscle powered robots be scaled up beyond the micro scale yeah, um, again, a great question. Um, so I would say that right now they're probably at the millimeter to centimeter scale. Um, the thing that that is preventing me from making them bigger right now is that I haven't engineered a blood vessel supply or something similar um, throughout the tissue. So the way that all of the cells inside this construct, pretend this is a millimeter, are getting in is that they're diffusing in from the surrounding liquid media. And if it got bigger, eventually you hit a like a diffusion limitation, right? Like so all of the cells in the middle of the construct are going to die because they're starved. They're starved of oxygen, they're starved of food, they're starved of sugar and amino acids. So they can't live. Um, so if I wanted to make them bigger, I would need to engineer some sort of blood vessel supply such that all of this liquid media is being perfused throughout the tissue so you don't have this diffusion limitation. Um, so that is absolutely something that um, I and a lot of other people in this field are working on. It requires new advances in 3D printing. It requires new understanding of how to generate branched vasculature or blood vessel networks within tissues, which is interesting not only for skeletal muscle, but any other kinds of tissues that people are engineering in the world. Um, so it's definitely something that the field is working on and it's something very important. 
one thing that I think for me is at this scale, I can still ask and answer questions about muscle that are relevant to human biology and to disease. Um, it's not so small that I can't see how thousands of muscle fibers are working together, but it's also not so big that I'm just kind of wasting reagents for no reason because I can answer all the questions that I have with this scale. So at this scale, I still feel like I can answer the questions that I'm asking. Eventually, if I wanted to say, replace somebody's arm because it got blown off in a bomb, then absolutely we would need to learn how to make something that was a lot bigger. Yeah, that gives us a lot to think about. Obviously, uh, research, this research in particular has a lot of uh, possible, uh, it has a lot of possibilities. I mean, if, if it actually works out uh, in the human context, it can be very, very useful. Uh, but, uh, and, and its applications are also, uh, there are so many wide applications that it could be used for. So here's hoping that um, all of it materializes. Um, uh, I think we've received so many questions. <laughs> uh, we're just going to have to take the last two, I think. So uh, one, questions, uh, one question that we have here is, uh, how would the body react to bio robots from, a, from the perspective of the immune system? Yeah, um, fantastic question. Um, so I would never, for example, take the robots that we're making right now and put them inside a human being. And the very obvious reason is that they are made out of mouse cells. Um, so the thing that we need to remember about the immune system, right, is that it's recognizing things as foreign and then fighting against them. So if I were, you know, things that I work on right now are how can we implant these inside mice and study their immune response. And if they are, then we look at how can we change the proteins or the materials that we're making these robots with um, and make sure that they're derived perhaps from the animal in which they are being implanted. And this is something that not just us, but anyone who's working on cell therapy or any kind of biological material being implanted to a person is thinking about. Um, and I think that's great because just like with the vasculature, it's one person can never answer all of these questions. So you need the field as a whole working on it. And I think that there are other researchers right now who have talked about how we can go from human skin cells to induce pluripotent stem cells, which can then be differentiated into skeletal muscle. So because of that work, we can then combine that with our work and perhaps fuse these things together where we replace our mouse cells with the human cells and then make constructs that should be made out of the same cells that are made that compose the human being from which they were harvested and then perhaps their immune system won't have as strong of a response to them it still might we don't know um and maybe we'll need to you know give them therapeutic drugs that help them fight that response or perhaps coat the muscle with something so the body doesn't necessarily recognize it as foreign um, all of those things might happen and we'll have to address them when they come but the first thing that i would do is to move from mouse cells to human cells <laughs> Definitely. Uh, Dr. Raman, I must say that the, the zest with which you speak about your research is actually very inspiring. And I'm, sh I'm so sure many of our attendees are, uh, you know, getting motivated to actually pursue research in the long term. Um, oh, I think that brings me to my last question for you. Um, just one second. Yeah. So, uh, we have read a lot about the the outreach work that you've been doing uh, throughout the course of your research. And we've also read about how much you advocate uh, the presence of uh, representation and women in STEM. You've been working a lot on that uh, in that ecosystem too. And uh, we just wanted to ask you um, from the perspective of a researcher, how important do you think it is uh, to have platforms such as India Science Festival where uh, researchers get to engage with uh, public in order to bring science closer to society? What is your take on it? Yeah, um, that's a great question. And I think really ties into what we were talking about through all the questions is there are so many questions that remain to be answered just in this specific field. And when you broaden that out into other aspects of medical research, like cancer research or COVID vaccines or energy or you know, new ways of producing food or agriculture, you can see that if in 2050, there are 10 billion humans that are all dealing with all of these problems, we're gonna need as many people developing solutions to address those problems as possible. And to me, when you exclude, in the case of women, if you exclude half of the people that could be working on this problem, or in the case of other underrepresented minorities in science, people of different races or different economic backgrounds, 
you're just saying you're just fighting against yourself really we're all fighting against ourselves if we aren't deploying the full force the full strength of human innovation by stopping people from achieving in these fields and so that's why it's really important to me um one just because i think it's just and fair to let everybody um work on something that matters to them and we shouldn't prevent them from education but also i think even if you're being completely selfish and you're like i don't care about other human beings i don't care about other women um you could still be like but i still want um, something in 50 years that looks like a safe and happy and healthy world to live in. In that case, even from a purely selfish perspective, you should be saying, let's just throw as many people at this problem as possible so that we can have solutions that help us out. So I think that's why it's really important for me whenever I have an opportunity to talk to young people who are maybe considering science or maybe think it's too hard or not interesting enough. It's a very rewarding career. It's very exciting. Um, and I think it's something that everyone can learn how to do. Um, and so that makes it very special to me and I hope that this and some of the other talks that you've heard have convinced you that there is something some problem out there that is worth you spending um, your time learning about and working on thank you that was that was so motivational I, I think uh, a lot of our attendees have definitely benefited from your words and I do hope uh, that in our quest for making science more accessible to our audiences they do all realize the wonders of science and the miracles that it can bring forth in taking us ahead as a society. So um, Dr. Raman, thank you so much for joining us. It was such a pleasure having you on board. And it was a very, very interesting talk. And I would uh, like on behalf of the entire team at ISF, uh, thank you so much for patiently answering all questions posed by our attendees. It was such a pleasure having you on board. Of course. Thank you for having me. And thank you, everybody, for your questions and your attention. Thank you so much. Um, I'd just like to tell our attendees that we have come to the end of uh, today's event, but we have so many more lined up for you on Saturday, Sunday, and the coming week. So we have interesting talks on um, how uh, humans can travel to other planets, how we can live and work in space. We have talks on how art can be created using artificial intelligence. We have a talk on how tribal songs and folk art can be used to uh, talk about science. We have one talk on how space science and science fiction are interrelated with each other. We're going to talk about aliens and extraterrestrial intelligence. One discussion is all about how music and science relate with each other. Uh, one is about how robots can be used um, in agriculture. So obviously, there's something of interest for everybody here. And I do hope that all of you bring in your friends and family to join us. We have some interesting workshops lined up towards um, in the morning time uh, tomorrow and day after. So make sure you head over to our web, uh, website and check out the events that we have for you all. Make sure to follow us on our social media handles. We are very active and we'll keep you updated on all events. We will also make sure that the best tweets about our events come to everybody's attention and that they get exciting prices. I hope you had a lovely evening. Thank you for tuning in and thank you for staying uh, with me till now. Um, hope to see you tomorrow. Till then, keep celebrating science and make sure you tune into India Science Festival to hear the voice of science. Thank you and good night.